It's a tad bit unfortunate, but the video for this endeavor was not captured. Uh, I put it down to the complacency that one experiences after a certain period of doing something. I suppose this would be the equivalent of a carpenter learning to craft a bit of wood and the chisel slipping and cutting their finger or in my case forgetting to press record the audio though was captured and uh, I hope the lack of video does not do injustice to this indaba um, in my view this is a very good indaba um, Dr. Celia Shunter really takes us through a ride through the natural world and her resource and and her research. So buckle up and uh yeah I hope this one's I hope you enjoy this one. Thank you very much. So I have to watch some of the, the other videos, but is there any kind of expectation or anything like that to be honest? Three. <laughs> Three two, expectations. Oh okay. One. <laughs> And we live, <laughs> Celia. Thanks so much for coming in. Really appreciate it. Like, yeah, I know it was a bit unexpected. Yeah, you sort of sit down and you're like, "What the hell am I doing? Is it? <laughs> what are the expectations?" No, there are no expectations. Really, it, it comes down to just, just sitting down, having a gin and tonic, a conversation, a chit chat, sort of like getting the science or whatever, whatever that whatever makes your eyes sparkle. We go into we go into that, and we sort of like follow that line. Um, yeah. Okay. All good. Um, did you have any trouble getting here? Yes. <laughs> or was it that terrible? Was it that bad? No, it's all good, right? Okay. So, uh, Quarry Bay, but then I've, I rarely come here, so it was literally just holding up the phone and trying to follow the, <laughs> where Google, the um, Google Maps, brings right. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then finding this entrance is, you know, it's, it's Hong Kong. Sometimes you're like, is this going to be on the 17th floor and I have to go into some <laughs> random, uh, you know, entrance and then take a lift and then... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's Hong Kong elevators. Elevators in Hong, Hong Kong are, synon are synonymous. So, um, you came up in my in my recent research because I had watched I, I watched um, David Attenborough's latest, which is um, uh, what was it? A person, a, a life on a planet, not you know not the living planet, but a life on a planet. And basically, it's a it's David Attenborough a David Attenborough's witness statement okay. about what's going on in the world at the moment with regard to, you know, what's going on with the environment, you know, CO2 and all of that stuff. And um, after that, I was, oh, see, I was kind of, you know, I've been a lifelong uh, um, a follower of David Attenborough, you know. He's the fellow that sort of, um, um, you know, I grew up coming home from primary school and then watching The Living Planet over and over and over again. It might have been a similar situation for you. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, he's been so instrumental on, on a no, mi millions of people. And, um, you know, his latest one, a witness, uh, it's, it's his witness statement. Uh, and a witness statement is given typically at a crime scene. Yeah, well. So this, 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 this yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and, and as far as, you know, you, you know as well as I do that, you know, David Attenborough is rather, you know, a very amen personable kind of fellow. And, you know, he approaches these subjects in a rather you know, offhand a sort of gentle way and, and this is him sort of like, you know, in his Attenborough, Attenborough way, taking off the gauntlet and throwing it down. Okay, yeah. And and you know, I thought, okay, well let, let me let me try and get a scientist. <laughs> let me try and get a scientist so we can go past the gore the the, the, the very top, you know, friendly um, mass uh, mass produ not mass producer, mass consumption basically and sort of see if we can get into the nitty gritty the science of it. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, your name turned up. Yeah. Oh, nice! And, uh, <laughs> and I'm quite honoured that you that you uh, that you accepted uh, this this uh, this invitation. Yeah, I mean, so, this is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, uh, maybe you could tell us a bit. Uh, you know, how did you sort of get into your marine biology, right? Yes. How did you get into this? Like, what's your story? Um, well, so um, actually, I come from a landlocked place. So I was born in Germany. Yeah. Um, and you know, although there is some sea in the north, but I come from the south, so I Teal. have not. That that would be the north. That's yeah. where there are some marine biologists there <laughs> uh, studying certain aspects. Um, but yeah, so I come from the south, a very landlocked place, and 
somehow from a very young age because we've moved around a lot as a family and then uh, myself as a as an adult um just got fascinated with the sea water was always something that was just you know attracted me and i think it might have been not maybe not so much david attenborough but uh like jacques cousteau and those mm. kind of um um people that were did a lot of marine related um things and went diving and showed the mm. world what what's going on underwater right you, you headed out now sebastian yes. cheers buddy okay nice to meet you <laughs> <laughs> okay jacques cousteau and then yes so because you know you don't um you don't get to see what happens underwater too often un mm -hmm. unless you go diving, right? Mm. Um, this is Alvin, correct? Alvin? Uh, you know, the under, under sea, the, uh, the, under, the undersea vessel called oh, Alvin, right? okay, so that would be, a, yes, one, there's one underwater uh, right. vessel uh, called Alvin, and there's Alvin 2, and there's all yep. kinds of different names over the years. I think Alvin might be retired by now. Yeah, I, I think, think so. they're using yeah. him anymore, him or her, who knows. <laughs> um, but... Um, yeah, so you, you, it's it's complicated for us to learn about that world, right? Yes. Um, because you don't get to see it every day. You know, you get to see trees and these kinds of things where mm. you can uh, relate to. But that world was just always very fascinating. And so I think it was when I was about 12, I told my parents I'm going to become a marine biologist. <laughs> All right. I was, I was very certain about that. And... Um, you know, uh, at the age of 18, I decided I needed to move to Australia because that was the best place to um, to study marine biology. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, a bit crazy maybe, but um, yeah. So that's what I did. I moved around across the world and and got to dive at the Great Barrier Reef. Um, Very nice. In my undergraduate degree, which is pretty spectacular. Mm. <laughs> Um, yeah, and ever since then it just increased uh, because more knowledge actually made me um, more fascinated with it, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's what often comes with, with the sea is that a lot of people um, can't relate to it that much because whatever is under the surface is just, you know, yeah. it's um, distant, mm -hmm. let's say. Mm. But once you get to see it and you get to actually put on some, a mask and to see a coral reef or any yeah. kind of other uh, kelp forest or other kinds of fascinating creatures uh, underwater, then you think, oh, this is, this is amazing, right? Maybe yeah, you know, recently there was a, a, a television, a, a movie called My Octopus Teacher. Mm -hmm. Did you watch that? I have seen that one. I have not seen the, the new Attenborough movie yet, unfortunately. Oh, you really should. You really yeah. should. I, oh, I will, But, but, sure, but that, uh, the Octopus Teacher is a fantastic yes, little... Yes, I've seen that movie, yeah. ...documentary, hey? Yeah. Uh, you know, this, this dude, you know, this South African. I am from, I'm from South oh, Africa. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So, so I saw, you know, seeing Cape Town and all that. I'm like, oh. <laughs> but um, yeah, this, you know the story about this fellow. He's sort of like this sort of depressed photographer, and then he goes back to his roots, and he sort of befriends this octopus, and makes you know, he just sort of documents everything. It was, oh, man, yeah. I, I would love to do that. I would love to do something like that. So just, just to have that kind of time to explore with with another organism mm -hmm. or, or a set of other organisms, mm. right? It's it's, mm. it's amazing. And mm. um, the the documentary itself made it very. Romantic, maybe. Oh, romantic. <laughs> romantic is good, I yeah, think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but probably can humanize the octopus, which, ah, uh, you know, then, then makes it relatable to us. Um, but I think the fascinating thing is also that they're also different, right, in the, right. In the marine world. Um, so there is different kinds of behaviors. Um, the way that these animals reproduce, mm. Um, mm. it's just so different to what we know. Yeah. And that's what I find very fascinating. Right, right. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a great story of, of how um, you know our mental health is somewhat also connected to nature, and if you spend more time in nature, you can um, kind of um, help yourself. But really. haven't you noticed that because of this this sort of lockdowns that that have been going around? You know, just hearing a bird cheeping kind of thing, it's like oh gosh, you know, it's like <laughs> like as Attenborough was saying, you know, like we are a part of nature, not apart from nature. Yeah. So like, yeah. Um, now the audience that sort of listens to this 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 sort of podcast, they don't they don't mind getting dirty, okay. In the sense that that, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not in that sense, <laughs> but uh, you know, like they don't mind getting their hands dirty, like like you know, you can you can let rip on 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 the science side of things. I'll try I'll try catch up, 
I'll try ask intelligent questions, no guarantees, and maybe you can hold my hand through... Uh, maybe I can answer them. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, along these lines. Yeah. Um, so, what are we facing? Now, let me, before I ask that, let me frame that question in the sense that, you know, there's a large groups of people that, that are into sort of like, you know, climate denial and stuff like that. And... It's really kind of risky to sort of like take that, especially since the amount of evidence as well as, um, you know, researchers and non-bullshit people that are dedicating their lives into, into this. You, one of them. Um, you know, this is also a way of like, you know, bringing forth the, 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 the scientific side and making, humanizing it, yes, can I let's, say? Yes, let's, let's bring it to the... <laughs> with, with the yeah. gin and tonic, right? Yes. <laughs> and, and, and I think this is a good way, sort of like, to you know, sort of, you know, just let us know, like, you know, how, what's going on. Like, yeah, so it's, it's not an easy time for scientists right now, to hmm. be honest, because um, I think um, scientists have always been seen... Um, as expert in certain things, right? So generally, a you know, scientific opinion was put forward, and that scientific opinion is based on a lot of evidence. Um, and then that that usually just became the, you know, the fact. Yep. Um, nowadays, it seems that everybody has an opinion about everything, <laughs> and this makes it harder for scientists to kind of um, bring across what is the actual fact, right? Um, and I think in terms of um, climate change, what we were saying before also, it's, it's trying to relate to that um, is hard. Why? Because we're saying that there's CO2 now in the atmosphere, it's then going to react with either, you know, we have greenhouse gases and it's create, uh, creating um, an increase in temperature in the ocean, we have the CO2 reacting with the water, uh, creating, um, you know, a, a lower pH levels in, in all the oceans and, and lakes of, in the world. So we, we're, we're, we're talking about these abstract um, processes. While they are fact, there's no doubt about it, uh, they're abstract processes, and I think that's why it, it seems hard um, uh, to understand or just to think about that as, okay, so this is happening, even though you, you can't really conceptualize it, um, and this is then what's creating an increase in temperature and climate change in general um, uh, on this planet. Um, so I think it's the relatability, actually, that okay. is, is probably a huge issue, and then it becomes this, do you believe in it? Um, there is no belief to there this, is right? No beliefs, it's not, yeah. Climate change is not a religion. It's like, do you believe in science? <laughs> Wrong question. Exactly. I, it's not the fact that you believe in science or not. Yes. It's it's it's, you it's know. not a religion or anything where where you have uh, where it's you know something that we can't prove, right? Yeah. These are things that are proved by science over and over again, and and generally science um, is a bit cautious. So to generalize, right, is a bit cautious about putting things out as facts because all of our methods are based on um, approximating things and always getting closer to the truth. And you will rarely see a scientist that says, this is absolute and 100% fact, because, uh, because of some experimental design, we might have been, you know, um, yeah. might have missed some part or might have um, just been able to estimate or correlate or... <laughs> Um, so that also comes into play that our language or the way that the science is set up, we're very rigorous in, in how we do things. So if it's not 100%, then we don't say it's 100%, right? We say it's 99.9%. .9%. And that's when then uh, someone can take and be like, oh, there's a doubt there that is left. <laughs> yeah. um, but it really isn't. Uh, it just means that all of this information that was built together, not from one scientist, not two, but thousands, right? So this is over many years, many studies on across the world. Um, it's all very global in this, in this sense, um, where then science is also um, reviewed from people from all over the world, right? So it's not something that is localized. It's not something that is, um, um, well, just specific to a certain part. So there's been a lot of evidence, basically. Yeah. And for, for a scientist, it, there's no doubt whatsoever. I think also maybe for the scientific illiterate, and I, and I say that because there are people who are scientifically mm. illiterate, um, 
you know, they might interpret the words of what a scientist says as hesitancy or exactly. doubt or I'm not too sure, whereas this person might be more uh, sort of convinced of those individuals who speak with the utmost confidence and, and you know, assertiveness and say, okay, that person I can listen to. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so in other words, don't, don't allow that, that sort of like hesitancy or, you know, reservedness. It, it's hard though, because so let's of course it take is. an example, right? So um, let's say COVID vaccine right now, let's, we have a thousand uh, um, um, people that we give a vaccine to, a potential vaccine, and let's say 800 of, the, of them react in a certain way and 100 react in another way and another 100 in a third way. Hmm. So then we can say that significantly <laughs> more people uh, had reaction A to, uh, in comparison to reaction B and reaction C. Yeah. So can we then say that reaction A is 100%? No, we can't, right? So, but it, the likelihood of reaction A happening is, is higher. Um, so we have this wording for a reason, right? Because um, nothing is ever this simple. Nothing is ever really 100% and yeah. you look across a population in nature or uh, that process happening over there, it's never going to be just um, um, 100%, right? We're, um, so that's why it's, it's hard for us to, to, and we're learning, don't get me wrong, there's, there's um, a new kind of field coming out calling, or quite um, important right now, calling, uh, called uh, science communication. And it's for people to bridge the gap between scientists because we need to keep our language. We can't just start overselling things, right? So our, what we publish in, in scientific papers still needs to be this rigorous language that we can't make bold statements. Uh, we have to have, um, you know, scientific language where we acknowledge that, you know, some part might react differently. And um, then we have science communicators uh, who can then take that language make it uh, put it a bit more into a broad sense which as scientists we're trying but I mean you know we're, <laughs> we've already trained so much for this one part it's very hard to then also be you know a manager a teacher uh, uh, a communicator a journalist like <laughs> yeah yeah it's so many yeah. things in once uh, or in one where um, of course then we prob have some struggles with it for sure Mm. Um, but you're right, that's what, what kind of needs to happen where um, science, where there is no doubt that climate change is happening and it's causing uh, you know, a lot of detrimental things to this planet actually right, right. Um, that are affecting us then also again in the end. And um, um, we have no doubt about it, but how do you sell it to people so that well, they also have no doubt? Well, let, let, let's sort of... Let's sort of um, frame that with when you say when, when you say we have no doubt about it like you know it within quantum mechanics they have done enough experimental data on 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 the theories of quantum mechanics which can be approximated by this analogy of measuring the length of the united states down to approximately the width of a hair from one end to the other that's pretty much how much um, uh, effort and energy that has gone into uh, uh, testing out the, the these these things. Now, yeah, granted, on 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 on, on um, some s within diff within sciences, you get different domains, and some of them are, you could say maybe easier or more mathematical in nature. And, and when, as soon as you start going into the biology side of things, you know, we start getting into that mushy biological stuff. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. like <Okay. laughs> it's like <laughs> that. that, that that mushy stuff that suddenly, you know, we don't, we don't get the same, you know, degrees of these physic, physics um, uh, equations and they don't have the same sort of, you know, um, uh, predictive model capacity as, as, as what they've got in the, in, in the physics. So, like, uh, uh, coming up with this body of evidence of, um, of um, knowledge, how certain in the sense, like, not you can, yes you can say yes we're very certain but like what has been done to show that we're so that that with this is certain um there's a lot that has been done and it it kind of covers different disciplines all kinds of different disciplines so my discipline is biology right so mm -hmm. i i study more the effects of climate change um but climate change um science very often comes from well, climatologists, 
So there's, um, um, there's also physics in there. There's a lot of predictions made in mathematical models for sure. Um, there's you know environmental sciences involved. Computer science um, too. Also for yes. the modeling, yeah. Yeah, and um, so it 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 comes then from kind of predicting and understanding the processes that are happening and then how they have been changing also the last mm. like 10, 20 years, um, and then already seeing these effects, right? Effects of of um, increased temperature or CO two. So actually. One of the things that I study is uh, ocean acidification, which um, is much more direct of a, of um, kind of an effect from from us p putting out CO two in the atmosphere, because the whole thing about greenhouse gases and then um, you know higher temperatures and poles are melting these kinds of things, um, they again are a little bit more abstract maybe too because there are several processes um, involved for that to happen eventually or to happen at the end, basically, they have the increase in temperature. But um, at CO2, um, when we burn uh, fossil fuels, that CO2 is what's going out in, into the atmosphere, right? And there is some, of course, CO2 in, in the atmosphere, but that has measurably increased uh, over, over the last decades. And then this CO2, uh, um, about 25 to maybe about 50% of that, is taken up by our oceans because they make up 71% of, of our planet. Um, and then you can directly measure that the pH um, goes down in, in these waters. So okay. it's, it's not something so abstract. It's like, you know, burn fossil fuels, there's CO2, we can measure the increase in CO2 and we can measure then a, um, um, a decrease in pH in the oceans. Okay, so, so you know, While some of the on some of the questions I already know the answers to, I'm still going to ask them. Mm -hmm. um, why does the ocean take up CO two? <laughs> Good question. Actually, do you know the answer to that one? No, 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 no. I don't actually. I was thinking along the lines of plankton, but then I was like, no, that's that's uh, that's ocean. No, it's it's just the water reacting with, uh, okay. with CO two. Okay. Yeah, it's just a water molecule that will then bind with the CO2 that comes right. to the surface and then, um, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it capture it, that might be a wrong word, but... Uh, okay, yeah, so absorbs, absorbing, absorbing the CO2. I, I suppose it's just through um, the equivalent of osmosis kind of thing, because it's more there and it's pulling it in. Is that right? Who knows? I'm not sure. Well, someone probably does know. I don't. Okay. Uh, so, but but yeah. it's a good question. I, I, I will probably investigate on this a little more. Okay. Um, okay. As to how much there's a pulling effect yeah. instead of just a, a natural like CO2 is there. Yeah. Now, I also understand that the oceans are starting, well, they, they've basically become saturated, essentially. And they're not able to pull in any more CO2. Is, is this kind of what's happening or what we're seeing at the moment? Uh, not quite yet. Okay. So we are... So we're starting to plateau on... Uh, on, on uh, uh, is it a plateau yet? I'm not quite sure. I think it... So uh, I... Now I wish I would have looked at the predictions again that, you know, were made, but... It's fine. Um, it's, it's I think it's... It's um, like... 2100 I'm guessing we're at a pretty decent okay. saturation level but yeah, yeah, there is yeah. a prediction That's when that will yeah. happen right now it, there's still lots of the, the actually I think is, you bang on with 2100 yeah is decreasing at, yeah, a, okay. at a rapid rate now and of course this is so again as a scientist I have to mention that this is not everywhere the same <laughs> Right. Some places, um, depending on also the temperature of the water, uh, depending on certain factors, um, there's more P uh, more CO2 being taken up, okay. um, and the pH is more rapidly declining, right. uh, whereas other places it's not as drastic, uh -huh. um, and it just has to do with the conditions of um, uh, of the water. Right, in right, right. Places. So and also the environment, maybe there's more trees, like if there's a forest or something in that area which is already absorbing in the CO2, who knows? Possibly, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay, okay. Okay, now, now from from what I've read about you, it's like you go into some pretty darn detail with regard to the, uh, the, the CO2 situation. I mean, it goes into like, you're, you're, check, you're observing the effects on fish, 
Yes. And all sorts of things. Like, okay, so, but you see, this is like a long, sort of like a, a drawn out story we can sort of like, you know, <laughs> build up to, right? And I don't want to go straight to that, to, to there, just at that moment, because, you know, like, what, what are the more visible effects of, of the ocean taking up CO2? So the, the more visible effects are probably um, effects on calcifying organisms. So in the ocean we have... What do you mean by You mean coral? Coral, for example. Okay. Snails, so all these kinds of shelled organism, uh, organisms to a certain extent, you know, lobsters and those oh, kind okay. of... Um, Shrimp. Um, yeah, they have, they all uh, use calcium um, to build their kind of shells or, or um, structures. Uh, that they live in, yeah, and uh, so with a lower pH, um, it's harder to what we call calcify. So it's seeping out the calcium to to try to neutralize the pH, uh, the the acidity, right? Not neutral. Yes, or, or, I mean or, or, the water would be yeah, doing yeah. that. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So usually shells become much more porous, brittle. Um, exactly. The, oh, I and see. And they are, they have a harder time um, making them also. So. Um, so basically, those structures are um, harder to form, and those organisms are probably uh, very hard hit by a lower level of pH in general. And these are even little creatures, right? So we have plankton that has some um, in the environment. It's not just the, the bigger creatures, but um, but that's yes. really concerning because plankton is the is the it's the bread and butter of the food chain within the ocean. So okay, so let, let let's make a a uh, hypothetical scenario let's say pH sort of increases to a point where plankton are like well pff, I can't play this game anymore I'm dead I'm gone okay. this is going to call like a what a trophic cascade is that the technical uh, term yeah that is the exact term okay yeah and and what is a trophic cascade well, it's when an effect happens at a certain level of the what we call the kind of food web or trophic structure uh, to what, it. So what the is trophic it? structure okay. is when um, you know you have um, some small organisms usually that are eaten by a little bit bigger organisms that are eaten by a little bit bigger organisms a little bit bigger so we get to the the big predator that is right. on top and that is a, a trophic food web um, mm. that is of course not not just like one uh, chain up but you know you have different levels but usually the bottom level is kind of the more uh, wide uh, level in this case so yes you're right if if okay. you take away that um, biomass at the bottom uh, what is the next level going to eat what is the next level going to eat etc <laughs> etc et so right. yeah they are very essential to um, to ecosystem functioning is what we call that to um, um, in in the oceans uh, particularly in in certain areas also so in the arctic and and uh, many other places that they are um, you know highly consumed by also yeah. um, larger creatures um, but yeah so they are um, important everywhere in the ocean why is why are the poles so uh, so important why are they so easily affected um, or susceptible to to change i mean it it, it feels like it it feels manic that that here we are in in these parts of the world, and this is where our activity is. And then, then all of a sudden, you know, on the poles, it's like we're 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 we're, we're, we're having such great effects on on entire biomes away from us. Um, wh wh why are the poles so, poles so uh, susceptible? Do you know? Um, so the poles have. I mean, everywhere plays a bit. Um, its role and I think I'm not sure if we could say that the poles are more susceptible it's just that the ice is oh. melting there right? uh, okay oh. um, but yeah. it does have an important um, in terms of the marine environment it has an important um, um, kind of place because um, it's very nutrient rich and they um, have um, a lot of the, the plankton biomass appearing and krill uh, appearing yes. in, in the, the southern parts there and that feeds a, down to um, or up let's say to um, a lot of different organisms that depend on it 
Yeah. Um, so that's why a lot of the whales, etc., they go and migrate uh, down to the South Pole, for example, to uh, go and feed during a certain period of their um, of their life. Um, and yeah, it's just it's highly productive that environment. Um, whereas, I guess. I'm not sure I can, I don't work on the poles, so I'm not quite sure if I can say that it's more sensitive to what's happening uh, in the marine environment. Um, I do know that actually around the tropical areas, we're going to have, we're going to actually see more impact. Okay. Um, because uh, what happens around the tropics is that um, generally the environment is already quite stable. So temperatures are generally stable. I mean, you can, we are subtropical here in, in Hong Kong, right? But it's still relatively warm around the year. Whereas if you go closer to the equator, it's pretty much the same temperature. Oh, yes. Or same, not same weather. There's, you know, often um, raining and, and dry seasons. But um, the temperature in the water and, and air temperature are usually quite stable. So these environments can be stable. So meaning that a lot of the organisms that live there have just be gotten used to that temperature right so they know how to live in that temperature they don't know how to live in other temperatures so now that the uh, temperature is increasing they are struggling more in those areas um, and that's why a lot of them are probably going to be highly affected by it um, in terms of even extinctions um, mm. uh, but some might manage to adapt in a certain way or move basically mm. towards more colder areas and we're uh, thinking around the lines that, uh, you know, we might get some more, even more tropical species here in Hong Kong, not too far in the future from now. Um, you mean get more tropical yes. species extinct or get more no, oh, uh, they, migrating to yes, this? In, oh, they yes, might come I see. Here. Oh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting, <laughs> yeah. Um, but that means, you know, so extinction is somewhat of a, of course, there can be global extinctions, but there can also be local extinctions. And we're changing ecosystems in certain areas. They might, for a certain a period of time, enrich uh, other ecosystems in mm. other places. Um, but on the global scale, it just means that we are uh, changing systems very rapidly. Okay. And, and, and typically, um, evolution... Uh, is is on the scale of you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of years, but yet the changes that have been introduced to the system are, are you know, within my lifetime, exactly. kind of thing. Yeah. And um, you, you know, even us human beings, we can barely adapt to this. Yeah. You know, <laughs> don't <laughs> don't don't don't, don't don't be so macho. We to turn off your aircon and see how long you last, kind of thing, yeah, basically. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. For anyone who 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 is in uh, in doubt. Yeah, I, th I was thinking about the poles. Maybe, maybe you said it was a very productive um, uh, place. I wonder if, if it could be because, because of the temperature, it causes the, the water to sink. And as a result, it's creating that sort of like, uh, you know, the currents of the ocean, basi basically. So, you know, those are the pumping engines of, of, of the ocean. And, and the currents are massively important for spreading nutrients and you know creating mm -hmm. dynamic environments around um, which leads us to that other th uh, I've forgot the technical term for that but uh, in, in the Arctic when, when, when Greenland, Greenland melts you know all that fresh water stops um, I believe it stops the the, the main uh, one of the main sort of currents uh, oh okay uh, to, 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 from 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 yeah. stops of water from from sinking. I forgot. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I. I. I can. <laughs> um, no. What you're talking about is the uh, is the Gulf Stream. Yeah. The Gulf. I think it's the Gulf okay. Stream. That's the one. Um, That's the one that goes through Mexico, if I believe. Yeah. Am I right? Well, the Gulf Stream <coughs> would be would be Atlantic. Well. Yeah. yeah. But Mexico is Atlantic. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So that side of Mexico. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> um. Yeah, I can't really comment on, on that. That's more for oceanographers to, ah, okay. to say. I just I know that um, there's places uh, around this this planet that are could be what what you just described. Right. The whole um, kind of currents happening and and water kind of um, sinking or or coming up from from mm. the deep. Um, we call it upwelling. 
upwelling. And okay. we have um, places like these around the world. For example, California is a really okay. um, a well-known place for it. Whereas California, generally in the, in the land side, you're, it's quite warm, but the oceans are, or the waters there are, are cold because uh-huh. they have a, a stream coming up from the north. Uh, coming from Alaska down mm. and then also the, at certain times of year they have this upwelling happening where water is coming from the bottom of the ocean and mm. it's coming upwards which then creates a completely different um, environment for for a little while mm-hmm. and in that case actually um, a lot of cold water is coming up and a lot of low pH water but with that at that not with the low pH but in general with the water coming from from the bottom you actually have um, a lot of like nutrients and, and uh, you know uh, things happening that um, increase the productivity of that environment for for a certain period of time. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. So maybe we can start to sort of like narrow in, in, in into your field of, of special specialty and 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 as you mentioned, you you were saying you discuss you you study the effects of. Um, of um, uh, CO2 or uh, and, and and warming of the oceans and um, specifically what what areas are, are you are you studying in in depth and detail? I go into the more 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 smaller thing <laughs> into the cells of organisms. Oh, good grief! Okay. And yes. <laughs> So just to make it more complex, Let's so we have a massive <laughs> system and that does this and it has downstream effects and then I go into the fish and the, yeah. Okay, um, but fascinating. You yeah, okay. you mentioned evolution before. So oh, yes. um, basically it's um, to look at um, our genetic code or the genetic code of, of these um, fish and how they're able to utilize it uh, to then... Adjust. Utilize what, sorry? The, the, the genome, their okay. genome, which yeah. is mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. Their, their genes that they're basically given and how they can utilize uh, that information mm-hmm. to deal with uh, a different environment than what they're used to. So you're studying evol- uh, evolution? It's evolution it? uh, in a certain extent because we do that also across generations okay. and we try to understand their potential to adapt uh, to an this environmental is change. fascinating. <laughs> I find it fascinating, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, so we are. We're basically so. We're basically trying to look into the future if we can eventually. But of course, that's so incredibly complex. Like you said before, biology is all this. Oh shit! I've got a million. I've got a million <laughs> questions that have just exploded in my head. Where do I even start? <laughs> and so it's it's a complex um, process, right? Of um, when you think about no, I'm not going to let you sweep that under the rug. Oh, okay. With, with a, <laughs> it's like, well, it's I, a I complex process. No, no, let rip, let rip. What do you mean? It, why is well, okay? Where, where, why is it a complex process? I mean, okay, keep going. Like, so, how, do you, how do you even quantify this? How do you, how do you, how do you go about? I assume you're going to try to create models. Eventually. Yes. Eventually. Currently, not just yet. So, so you're, you're prior to the point of actually uh, yeah. the, the the crick. We, we came up with a DNA model. <laughs> you just got a bunch of data and you're like, well... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so... Um, in, we, you always need um, knowledge that you base certain things on, right? So it, to be able to create a model, just yeah. like Francis and Crick, yeah. it's not like they just came up with that without any prior knowledge, right? Yeah. So they ha- had a lot of knowledge from all kinds of different scientists that were yeah. put and they just kind of put it together in the end, which is very often what happens. Um, and that's why they always discuss just over the last weeks about Nobel Prizes. They should be all to like attributed to more than just a few people, right? Uh, they should go out to all these other people that these scientists base their work on. But yeah, this is lo- longer discussion. But then but it's going to become like the citations of, uh, yeah, or, or exactly. the authors of I physics know. papers, right? It's so, like, oh, for God's sake. Um, yeah. yeah, no, so... Um, Basically, you need to first understand um, other mechanisms to be able to later extrapolate it towards the future, right? Okay. Um, so we are at this basic part where um, kind of we need to take a step back. Maybe. Ta- you you yeah. might, you might, because we, we, we're essentially <laughs> discussing the scientific process, which has been evolved <laughs> over 200 years, yeah. right? And, and I think, and we've certainly got the time. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, um, so about twenty years ago is when uh, we, as 
you know, scientists or humans or whatever, um, uh, sequence the first genome. Yes. And the genome information uh, is incredibly important for us to then understand how we use that genome, right? Right. And to tell you that 20 years ago we sequenced the first genome, which was probably done on hundreds and hundreds of sequencing machines with thousands and thousands of people working on that just to have the first draft of a genome. Yes. So a genome is basically we, we, we get pieces of our DNA and we then puzzle it together. I always think of it as like a puzzle. Using the shotgun but, method. Wait, exactly. So you start, you, you could use, choose a shotgun method, and uh, but it, it then means that you have these tiny pieces and you need to put the puzzle together mm. without having you know the box outside where you have the nice picture right like, this is how it should look like <laughs> you don't get that indication you don't know because it definitely was the first genome at that point point. Um, and then it's like okay so we put this together so there was a first draft coming out but that didn't mean that this is the final draft we yep. are 20 years later and I'm they're still working on that draft Okay, so it was it was if it was very much a draft, and, and Craig Fenter and the British guys, um, they, they it wasn't it wasn't uh, an accurate. Uh, it's, well, it's not that it's um, it, no, it's not inaccurate. Okay. It just means that it wasn't completely final, and we are never. I'm not sure if we're ever really going to get to the very very final part. Okay. Um, I hope soon though, but um, it also has to do with the fact that it, a genome usually is based on one individual. And then you take the next uh, of the same species. So this was human, right? So you take the next human and then um, you end up having a bit of a different genome. So mm. you have to make figure out where it's different. Um, so we, it's, it's a process that has developed massively over the last 20 years mm. so that we don't need a thousand people to do it and 200 machines running constantly for, I don't know. But the cost, but no, but this, is one of, this is one of the exponential uh, things. Like, for example, computers had an exponential graph of, of uh, increased computation and, and a drop in price. But uh, this field is one of the things that demonstrates even higher exponentials in the sense that uh, so much more data has been done for yes, yes. orders of magnitude uh, a reduction in price. Yes. Um, and it's still, um, the price probably is changing, but not as exponentially anymore. But we okay. do have new technologies coming out that help us um, make longer puzzle pieces, for example, which okay. then helps a lot. Um, and so it's been an evolving field for the last 20 years. Right. And we started off with, with what we call model organisms. So uh, a fruit fly is a model organism, a mouse is a model organism, right. and humans, and of course, uh, because you know, we're one. very self-centered on us, we are important, so we... Oh, <laughs> well, you know, at once we thought we were the center of the universe, yeah. didn't we? <laughs> uh, don't we still think that <laughs> <laughs> I wish we there, there, there are people who believe the earth is flat to remember oh, that so you're yeah. probably right <laughs> yeah. so yeah I and anyway so there were these model organisms for which we had like, yeah. created these first draft genomes for yeah and so but of course what, what was in the ocean really wasn't it's not a model organism right because can we really get any Medical, oh, point. medical things out of it. Can we use it for anything that's related to us? So, mostly no, <laughs> except for maybe a few, um, um, uh, yeah, a few organisms that were of interest. But but generally, it was more focused on on right. uh, making these genomic, well, genetic genomic uh, resources available mm. for model organisms, so that we can test certain things on mice. Um, on um, well, we don't test it on humans, but on primates, other other um, um, kind of monkeys and, and other things that we use sometimes for testing, and um, so we focus on these organisms mostly. So, so would could 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 I use the analogy? There, there are websites like Twenty Three and Me, mm -hmm. uh, and and similar sorts of website which which basically allow you to see your ancestry and basically you know. What, roughly what part of the world, you know, maybe you have Norwegian or, or African or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so so you, you're able to extrapolate this form of information. So essentially you're doing 23andMe, but not just focusing on humans 
it's kind of like you know you're putting you you you're making this you're gathering information across the entire uh, evolutionary tree. Uh, I won't say okay. You're specializing in one domain area, but you're contributing that basic research into into the scientific body of knowledge. Um, and then maybe somebody or other scientists who would specialize in, in the computation would then take your data as their input and then create higher form, different forms of uh, uh, models on top of that. Is that is that essentially it? That's what all of us scientists do. Okay. Um, some people take certain data or yeah. just the knowledge that we get out of out of certain areas. But yes, you're right with the analogy with uh, 23andMe. Uh -huh. 23andMe was a um, was based on having a human genome and having lots of information of other humans around the planet. Mm. Um, so we were able to establish what we call markers in that genome um, yeah. and then know that that marker is, is more of something that you know you might come from um, Sicily or you might be right. um, your ancestry is more over there or mm. and how much part of your genome belongs to also our um, predecessors, right? So mm. you can see how much, uh, how many percent of Neanderthal you have still. It's like, oh, your, your family's <laughs> been lots <laughs> of. Uh... <laughs> yes. But this is all based on massive efforts, right? So, right. so 23andMe is a company actually, but it's based on, on, I would, I would say billions and billions of dollars, um, or other currencies, right? So, um, from around the world, there's been initiatives in the U.S., initiatives in Europe, and. Um, here in Asia as well, everybody has EGI. kind of c could contributed uh, exactly contributed in in um, manpower or money or sequencing power to gather all this information. And all this information is public, not the twenty three me, but the information is is publicly available. And mm. um, so then you can take and go to these databases and dig into that information. And that's what twenty three and me does because it dug into that information and then realized, okay, if you have that marker, you're more from there. You have that marker, you're more from there, and kind of uh, did a startup company or a, a, um, um, an economically relevant uh, um, base out of it. Whereas if you're using twenty three and me. Um, I'm not sure if they are actually making their uh, data public. I don't know. Mm. But um, all of these just generally um, uh, these um, projects that have people um, con take use their DNA to, to get sequenced yeah. would add to this database. And actually, uh, you know, it's not about cloning you or anything like that, which sometimes people think that, but it is really about having more information available. The more information we have, the more we can identify uh, not just ancestry, right, but it's um, uh, medical issues or certain types of diseases um, and um, find out you know, maybe there's a marker for height, or maybe there's markers for um, a, a certain, I don't know, hair color, or you know, so mm. we, the more information we have um, across all different humans, um, the, the more we will know about it, and the more we can actually do with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did, a, I did an Indaba with uh, Scott Edmonds, you prob do you know Scott Edmonds? Okay, um, uh, he's a good fellow. Uh, He's one of the. He, I think he's the founder. He works for BGI. Oh, okay. And um, and he's he's creating this sort of like a. Essentially, it's a, it's a journal, um, that does the sort of open. Do you, are you familiar with open source? Open source. Okay, so open source model of developing software, is sort of applying it to genomics and, and like this sort of thing. Um, and I th I think it's called Giga Science. Oh but yeah, yeah, I, yeah. You know Giga Science, I've yeah. I've not published in it, but okay. But yes, so he course, he's yeah. he's the fellow behind that. He's mm -hmm. a he's a one of the, 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 the top dogs in there. Okay. Um, and then he's also created something called Gigabyte, I think Gigabyte, which is about the actually associating. I think it's about associating the data with the publication, so it it becomes entirely reproducible. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like oh, okay, you can read these papers. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's your, where's your data? Where's your data, bro? Um, so here we we actually. Uh, you can actually clone. You can actually pull down the the, the, the paper as well as all the associated data, mm -hmm. in with the, with the, with the objective of being able to reproduce it yourself. Um, so so yeah, that's I think that's that's a for me when I hear that I, I'm like oh just just round of applause Scott. 
Like that, that, that is so needed. <laughs> it, it's a, well, I have to say it's a must nowadays though. Oh yeah. So oh really? I, I cannot publish anything without having my data put online. Is that so? But then, but then, but data. then but at some point. But you might have started some part of it, right? Yeah, so, no, but at, but at some point you, yeah. your data just goes offline, you know, things change, you know, see what I mean? So this yeah. is the idea is to try to make yeah. it persist in, into, into, yeah. into the future. Into the future. So, so generally, we, we have several um, places where scientists would upload genomic, or okay. geno genome related kind of data. Right. And um, yeah, these are so you know people don't realize that these are massively funded uh, databases yeah. that um, that they do persist. <laughs> if they would ever go down, would have a serious problem, right? Uh -huh. um, um, but yeah, okay. so. All of our data must actually be online. There, there are the odd times that some data wasn't uploaded or it was lost or something like that. And mm. that's always, that th comes up in the news or at least for us scientists in the news was like, oh, this paper was published and nobody has ever seen the data. So generally it's, um, okay. it's, right. uh, it's well checked that you make sure you, have, you upload okay. it. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, so essentially, and, and, and a day's work for you, what does that look like? Some days are very different from each other. So a general day, uh, right now it's uh, the semester, right? So at university we... Um, HKU, right? Exactly. Yeah, okay. We have uh, this mixed mode of teaching, which is confusing for everyone, I think. Yeah. But we're getting a hang of it right now. Um, but yeah, so uh, I guess an average day right now in this semester would look like that I kind of go to work and or before I go to work, I read my email and I already answer a bunch of them and then I come to work and I might have a meeting um, I then after that go to lecture prepare for lecture go to lecture um, and after that probably meet some of my postgraduate students and then there'll be time hopefully although lately not so much of um, kind of working on my own data or my own experiments mm. so it's a bit of teaching research mentoring and meetings in terms of um, because of course we have you know lots of um, uh, how do we actually call it right now I'm thinking about it so uh, kind of university related um, um, issues right so if, are we creating a new curriculum for for oh. teaching hmm. are we uh, going into that direction are we getting more funding over here and uh, so lots of decisions to be made at certain levels of, of the university yeah, um, yes i remember reading somebody's tweet who was tongue-in-cheek saying science is not about the scientific process science is more about uh, every application for grant that you make, <laughs> essentially, yes. it's kind of become okay. to that point now. Grant applications are, yeah. are, are probably the biggest, my biggest time uh, consumer. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. And it is, it is a very ineffective process, to be honest, because you have all these scientists spend a lot of their time of writing an application and yeah. then you have just a certain percent of it funded. Yeah. So um, in the end, it seems like our salaries are going to, <laughs> to invest in this grant application because, you, you know, you spend time on it yeah. and uh, only a few percent of it, depending on where you apply for a grant in Hong Kong here, it's probably 25 to 30 percent of, of uh, grants are fu funded, depending on, the, on mm -hmm. the application type, but the main one each year which is pretty large, to be honest, in comparison to the rest of the world. In other places, it might be 5% or even 4% of all applications that actually then receive the funds. So then you try again next year, try this, imagine how much time is spent <laughs> on writing these applications. Um, um, but I guess there is, it's a very hard, um, it, it's very hard to change that because you do need to have a good application and a good, a good study coming out of it right so not everything is worth funding of course like we can't just like write something and be like fund me um but it does seem like a, a, a very tedious way of receiving money to do then research right well yeah. how would how would you fix that process uh, okay if you, if you were to sort of like get like the equivalent of a blank check oh. <laughs> and 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 you know uh, a, a clean sheet of paper in order to write the rules what what would that process look like by the way, can I can I top you up? Sure. All right. <laughs> so this. Um, so this 
So that is a good question. Ah, just wait. So I I recently did an indaba with a. The gin people, you say? The gin people, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, this is the nip guys, and, 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 and they, gifted me a, they gifted me a bottle of this rare, rare dry gin. Oh, and I so get to drink it. Thank you. You do, you do. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> All right. Um, you say when? I'm just, like you did before, I think that's probably okay. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we're... Keep going, right? Yeah. Well, no, <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. Okay, I'll also have a little bit of a... Oops, that's enough. Uh, yeah, you, you go on, you tell me what... Uh, oh, uh, the blank check. How yeah. would I deal with that? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's... It, I mean, it's hard when you have limited funds, right? And mm -hmm. you are trying to fund only the best uh, kind of... best projects. Mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. Um, probably going to get get the best output. Um, you're asking me very hard questions. Ah, oh, come on. Um, I mean, no, this is a hard one actually because it is, it because is. it's we it's. Um, I guess one one alternative would be to just kind look, of provide look, look. a baseline every year. Like if you if it's a scientist that is hired, uh, basically without spending time every year on every application give them a certain amount of money no matter what right so and universal basic income kind of thing right no, not the income right so uh, our salary is paid by the university no matter if you receive a grant or not oh, our, okay. our, our our salary is paid because we teach and okay. so the grant uh, the grant money is for us to do research and to have postgraduate students to you know salaries and for uh, postgraduate students or postdocs or research assistants mm. that's what the salary is that, uh, that would be salary related and then you need money of course to um, go do field work or, or um, buy reagents and or do sequencing <laughs> so um, that's what the grant money is then for and I guess if you have a certain baseline you can always have a good process up and running and you don't always depend on oh now my grant ran out and the grant was only for three years, but then I, you know, I need to start some. Okay, so so so, you, you, what, uh, so so you've got a basic just to keep the lights on on the research department. That's what you mean. Uh, Enough this is money when to we're keep. We're talking about that. If I had to redo the system. Sure, right? sure, sure, this sure, is sure, not sure. The case no, no, currently. no, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I had to do, I, I think that might be a nice way of us not to waste our time on smaller applications, right? Mm. Because if you have that funding come out. Um, or have that every year. You can pay certain people and you can do certain things with it on a regular basis. And it's mm. not like we scientists aren't judged generally already by the number of publications we have. And um, so you would end up kind of already kind of eliminating people out of the system. That sounds really bad, but... No, no. Um, evolution. It, evolution. It, <laughs> that's not evolution. <laughs> 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 but, you know, you, you do... <laughs> You do kind of, this is just one generation, right? So we're not talking about evolution. Um, uh, yeah, so you would, um, because of publications and things like that, um, you would end up, um, for example, not receiving tenure if you didn't okay. publish, which is a, a method of um, going from temporal contracts to permanent um, contracts. Mm. Um, so if you had a baseline, at least we wouldn't waste our... It's not wasting our time, right? It's also important to form these questions. And, and so it is a somewhat of a good practice. But maybe we can not focus on the small ones, but then have more uh, time to spend also on bigger collaborative grants that um, might not seem so tedious, probably. Okay, okay. All right, well, okay. Let's get back onto your your oh, yeah. your, your <laughs> major thing. I think we, we, we sidetracked there a bit. Um, okay, so so you basically you're you're on genomes, mm -hmm. and specifically, am I right in saying that your understanding on a molecular level, uh, molecular gen gen genomic level, gen genomic level? Can I say that? Well, it depends on on molecular or genomic. I mean, both oh, okay. is, is somewhat. Well, okay, so, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't have my scientific lingo down on tap, right? 
Okay, okay. Uh, um, and and okay. So you so on a molecular level, I shall forge forward with that, with that, with that uh, terminology uh, on the effects of, of, of carbon dioxide mm-hmm. on, okay. on on yes, on sorry, on, on living organisms. So it looks like the gin. It looks like the gin is taking a good effect. <laughs> definitely got sidetracked there. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I had started with uh, t- talking about how genomes were sequenced 20 years ago, and then yeah. a lot has uh, changed over the last 20 years. Right. And just over maybe the last five to seven years, which is my kind of, um, maybe not the complete scientific career, but during my PhDs when I started working on genomic or molecular data, either one, okay. uh, I use sequencing as a, as a method of, of looking okay. at what hap- what's happening in the cell in a very broad level, right? So we, um, we had the capabilities because of the change in technology to also use this um, on non-model organisms. So remember how I said model organisms before were like mice and, and right. um, our oh, lab rats, okay, basically. Okay, okay. And, and then after a time, though, us more ecologically focused um, uh, scientists, we thought, but we don't just want to understand mice and bio... Uh, um, you yes, know, bio how medical. boring. How boring. <laughs> I no, want to <laughs> it's very important. I would never <laughs> of say course that. it is. Of course it, it is. is. <laughs> um, but we do need to understand our natural environment. Right. And um, from going from more rudimentary methods um, to, to study populations or, or individuals uh, yeah. that were not mice or rats, which are not model organisms, um, we went over to use these technologies and, and um, techniques to start uh, te- looking at non-model organisms, so the ones that are just out there. And so this is, was at the beginning of my PhD where it was a huge struggle to then move over to when we don't have a super nice genome reference to be able to study these things uh, no matter what um, in, in these organisms that are ecologically relevant. Maybe right. not biomedically okay. relevant, mm. but ecologically relevant. Mm-hmm. And uh, so over the years, it's gotten a bit better and there's been lots of, um, they're all open access, kind of um, freely available um, uh, methods of of um, you know also y- using okay I'm kind of jumping now computational biology yeah, because sure. in the end that's what you need uh, when you do a lot of sequencing uh, when you do a lot of sequencing of the genome or um, RNA or even if you're looking at uh, yeah. proteins mm. uh, so if you're looking at the, uh, a holistic approach of what happens in a cell or a tissue of an organism. Yeah then you end up producing a lot of data. So yeah. it's a lot of, for you example, need to crunch through all a- of that. Yeah. AGCTs, which are, you know, what, what our uh, gene genetic code is made out of. <coughs> yes, yes. And so you have billions and billions of these letters. <laughs> yes. And then you need to make sense of them. And that's what you need, what we call um, well, bioinformatics. So, 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 so uh, I, I took a couple of months off just to try, just try to go into this because my really? background is, is, is computer science, oh, writing okay. programs, right? All right. And, yeah. and I, I looked into this area and I was like, right, this looks like a fun area to, it you totally know. Is. It totally is. <laughs> totally. Holy shit, the scales, the scales, <laughs> what the amounts of data you're dealing with. Yes. Oh, you know, well, there's... The, the, do, don't you deal with that amount of data in other... Oh, you know, finance big data, the, 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 the buzzword big data, yeah. that's, that's small data. The, the data in that, w- that all these companies are talking about, oh, no, no, it's just small data. Big data is fucking biology. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm glad that's to hear real this. big data. I'm always very kind of, you know, because we, uh, we myself, I ended up learning how to program and then all my, mm. my students, they're all in uh, trying their first like coding and you move to Linux and you need to use a terminal, which my oh, old, shit. old really? PhD advisor used to call the black box. And <laughs> so you go, you go through this process and, and you have also people that I recruit to my lab. They're usually ecologists or marine biologists. Yeah. And, and I'm like, well, but you know, you're really going to be sitting in front of the computer, right? Writing code. And they're like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, okay, let's do this. This sounds like fun. It sounds like a really good tool. And then, and then they're three, like, <laughs> three, three weeks later, they're like, uh, <coughs> oh, everybody's struggles but i have to admit that most people end up liking it no it's fantastic yeah it's fantastic <laughs> but what, what okay well let, let, let's okay, nerd out a bit on the computer science of it and then we will we'll, we'll, what, what what languages are you using um so we are different kinds so it, it moved from Perl to go to more to python Okay, yeah. Um, uh, Perl used to be the one used in biology and yeah. i think now it's just python honestly yeah, 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 okay yeah. okay 
and then small things like awk or any kinds of other sure, kind sure, of sure. more um, oh i would not i would not have imagined i'd be talking about <laughs> the, the, this is my bread and butter this is this is my oh, okay. yeah. This, yeah. The, the, these domains are my bread and butter yeah yeah, yeah. so so <laughs> surprise surprise yeah. the biologist that's the marine biologist and you would think she might go swimming with dolphins on her daily on her daily <laughs> and she, here she is ripping out pearl scripts <laughs> yeah. and python scripts exactly this is more what we do scientists yeah. are Yep. In the end, uh, it's either molecular lab work, which, you know, tedious kind of um, pipetting or something like that, or, yeah. or working through um, large data on a computer. Right, 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 That's right. That's more but what don't you also, look like. But don't you also gather the data too? Yes. So, so you see, that's where it becomes a lot more fun. Yes. It's not just behind the computer. Oh, you, you go out there on the boats and, you know, do whatever you do with your fish and I, whatnot. <laughs> I love that mix. That's the thing. Yeah. So, even even going out diving, um, so during my PhD, I went out every single day for six months. Oh. And while that was lovely, or that sounds really nice, right? Yeah, after Everybody a while, else is like in yeah. the office, and you're outside, and it's beautiful when the weather weather is calm, and you have this like mirrored water, and you go in, and you're like, oh, I love this. The other days when there's like waves crashing and <laughs> and you're and heaving <laughs> overboard. <laughs> yeah, <lot>. exactly. <laughs> so then it does not seem that much fun anymore. But yeah. After six months, even, you know, you're just tired of this, doing the same process over and over yeah, again, yeah. Uh, no matter what it is, no matter if it's diving and it seems like, oh, you're so lucky, you go diving. But yeah. after, you know, even a few months, you're like, oh, God, I wish yeah. I would do some, something else. But that's why I, I love my job um, because I mix all these things together. Mm. Um, mm. But it's also kind of my field that I ended up working in of, of doing all these things um, some at some point. Right? Yeah. So I do go out. We do do experiments in in the um, kind of in aquarium systems where we expose fish to future climate change scenarios. So yeah. we do it in an enclosed environment as well, yeah. uh, which is a lot of work actually to have. You know, if, if I don't know if you ha do you have a any kind of goldfish or something at home or? <laughs> well, no, I mean, I used to do quite a bit of scuba diving back in the day. So like, yeah, yeah, I mean, I got well. Why, why, why do you ask? No, I mean, if you had um, the, the goldfish is because... Um, so we also run experiments, right? Controlled ones. Okay. And so that means that it's a lot of work of taking care of fish and, oh, and controlling the environment. Uh, and I see, yes, yes, yes. Yes. So we have these two parts of it. We oh, go because you're doing field. generational stuff, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So you're doing the equivalent of what, 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 what one would do with fruit flies. Yeah. You're doing with, with, with goldfish. Except for that a fruit fly reproduces every... Much, much quicker than... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, maybe, maybe we'll have some fruit fly scientists tell it's, me later. It's like, like, I wish we had fruit flies. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, so especially some of the coral reef fish that we work with. Yeah. And it's two years of oh, generation shit. time. Yeah. Oh, shit. So do three generations is six years. Okay. Um, but then these are, you know, ecologically relevant fish that are vertebrates that are yeah. out there. Mm. Um, um, having an important role... And that's why it's, you know, we don't just want to use a fruit fly because it's convenient in a way, right? <laughs> um, yeah. And sometimes it's, it takes a long time to, yeah. to yeah, study yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right. So, so, so the, the, the generational stuff, um, how does that, you actually, you would, uh, you would actually have to kill the, 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 what, the sample? What would you call it? A sample? Let's de let's de it. <laughs> yes, okay. we, we have to give it a name. <laughs> it it's, is a it's, sample. Yes. It's a sample, right? Okay. <laughs> I was going to say dehumanize, but I'm like, no, no, it needs to be de um, Okay, so so you, you, you'd have to kill the sample. So you'd have uh, another number of different generations going on, and as each generation goes, then you'd kill it. You'd get the sa the, the the DNA sample, and then. Uh, by the way, I think it's very canny of you to use this low orbit ion cannon technology equivalent of of uh, dna sampling uh, you know the, the 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 exponential cost advantage that you get and apply it to this field because you know it's gonna it's gonna churn out papers it's gonna churn out research well maybe it, 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 <laughs> your, your response was not not <laughs> not, no, not, not not the kind of response i was, I was looking for i was like should I should I admit that that's the uh, the whole no I you no know, okay. the whole idea is is that as a sci as scientist of course what you want is to find out something new right, right yeah this is the the fun part about it you actually get to study something yeah. that nobody has done before it's like a new cave system and you're the only one with a torch that just walked in there exactly that's what you're doing it's amazing yeah um 
so of course if you make a bit of a bigger jump in terms of new um, ideas or new knowledge yeah. then that goes into papers which yep. is our currency right so scientists have their currency is how many papers and or what impact those papers had no oh, um, let's not even get started exactly. on impact <laughs> metrics and so yes whatever. in the end yeah. for us it is to publish that work right yeah um, but so using different methodologies to um, or kind of going across fields is probably what also um, helped me and other people but we yeah. were in this area where we kind of started something new by we're not ecologists we're not just marine biologists we're not molecular scientists so we're a bit of nothing <laughs> Yeah, and code slingers too. And, coder, and, and bioinformaticians. <laughs> so we're a bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but that helps to then be able to, to cross a breed between disciplines, which before mm. was always very separate. And right. it, it is quite needed nowadays, I find, um, because, um, yeah, their fields are not just by themselves, right? And you yeah. needed that information. I mean, same thing. We needed all that ba that basic, inf not basic, but the no, general basic. information yeah, yeah, um, it's, it's from from each field and like more concentrated on it yeah. to be able to do that cross going across uh, fields. Yeah. So I'm basing my research on a lot of people's sure. no knowledge that sure. they produced, sure. right? So yeah. once again, that's a <laughs> it doesn't yeah. just come out from one day to the next. Yeah, well, I um, think when a scientist says basic research, they don't mean like yes. simple. Exactly. They, that's it's why very, yeah, I, I know. But I, I have a problem with that word because a basic research is when we create knowledge right it's not yeah. applied if it's yeah. not applied it's basic yeah. but it's not simple <laughs> by no, it, any means yeah it's fundamental it's exactly. it could, it maybe an alternative meaning for for basic mm. research would be like basic physics i remember sitting in washington and i sat across the table from a scientist and we were we were having we were at some ethiopian restaurant and now it was my first time i was at an ethiopian restaurant and and he was saying yeah we're doing basic research and i'm like Basic research. What the hell are you talking? About? <laughs> yeah, shooting fucking ion traps over. That's not basic. And he's like, oh, okay. Oh, ah, yeah, I understand. As a, as a techno peasant, as a, a scientific peasant, now I start to understand <laughs> what you mean by basic research. Yeah, okay. I think fundamental is a better word. You're fundamental, right. Fundamental. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. another um, uh, clean check that we need to restart <laughs> over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that caught me. That caught me. Um, oh, so, okay. So. It, so the cross-pollination of different fields. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what I, I kind of started with a few other people around the world that are um, applying these kinds of um, like different techniques to answer a question, right? Right. And um, so that's why in, in, in my case, I, I started off with um, marine biology. But yeah. then I... But that's where the heart was. That's where the love was, right? Exactly. Yeah. And the PhD came in genetics. Oh, interesting. Which, which meant that I, I had realized at some point that um, genetics in general, right, this includes the genomics and molecular, yeah. is, is an important tool to use to actually have more, um, let's call it finite, I don't know if you can say it, but to have a little bit um, more of quantitative knowledge behind to be able to say this is how it is. Very often oh, in, I know in, in ecology, it's very, uh, you have observations, you know, and things like that. Whereas in genetics, it's yeah. um, the marker exists or it doesn't exist. Oh, this so sounds like the German side of you coming yeah, through, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if there's more geneticists in, in Germany or not, but it's just, it just felt like a powerful tool to use, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's when I got into the genetics and then when, when this whole genomic um, or sequencing, um, we call it next generation sequencing, mm. whereas um, we probably are in the next next generation sequencing now, right? Mm. Um, um, that came or became feasible. Um, and then I started actually, uh, you know, producing all that amount of genetic data mm. for which then I needed to teach myself how to code because... Oh shit, that must have been very intimidating <laughs> for you. <laughs> oh, Because you, you're, tra you're trailblazing there. <laughs> So it's, it's like, yeah, yeah, you've got all this data and you're like, now what the fuck do I do with this? Exactly. <laughs> like, That's pretty much exactly what happened. <laughs> and at that point in time, it was only the um, model organism people mm. that were kind of working with this. And, and of course, I, I was like, oh my God, can you help me with this? And they were like, no, without a reference genome, how are you able to do that? So, <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm going to try anyways, kind of thing. <laughs> And, and over the years now, it's become... Do you amazing. have any Irish blood in you? Oh, no. <laughs> Why? Just Why kidding. The stubbornness. <laughs> okay. Just kidding. Uh, well, if you 
you want to make a difference, sometimes uh, no is not no is course. not a yeah. good answer. No right? is not not an answer yeah. at or, all. Or yeah. that, that's it, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, and um, yeah. So then I taught myself how to code, and over time now it's become a lot more common, right? So yeah. a lot of um, um, a lot of the f- like kind of even molecular biology or genetics field have evolved that they are also studying more not just the model organisms yeah. and sequencing has involved the technology there to just process things faster and better yeah. and bigger and um, and yeah now a lot of ecologists have also moved towards uh, looking at what happens in the in the genes so we have now certain pipelines set up if you want um, no, you don't need to do that. Pipeline yeah, is like a second line. It's a like part of my language. Maybe for you, but we just <laughs> oh, that's discussing, true. Okay, we that's were discussing true. this yesterday with, with the lab. Um, there was a very funny tweet that somebody placed. Um, oh, I had a laugh. And it was um, it was about, you know how sometimes when they make these games, especially during during like Corona times that people are at home, they have this like um, oh, yeah, so the, domino uh, gold, effect the gold, of things. Goldberg, uh, uh, um, yeah, they, like the you know the like the balloon will pop and it will raise and then knock over something and then dominoes will fall exactly. over exactly and then you end up having the the music yeah. start or something oh something exactly so this the, <laughs> there was this tweet yesterday about this video of someone doing this but literally at every step nothing worked I saw that so okay <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so then somebody commented on it it's just like every bioinformatic pipeline that I've used. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's, so it's like you know, like the racket falls over, and you're like, and you do it yourself, and exactly. then you're like, you lift it up again, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. you yeah. redo and it, then, and then and then and then you turn on the music, and you stand back, and you're like, <laughs> yes, you have the magic happening at the end, but yeah. the way is never as nice. So that's why I said pipeline because it's never just a pipeline. It's not like yeah. you can press start and this thing runs through, and yeah. then you get the final result. <laughs> Every single step, it's like, oh, why does this, did this not work? Why is that parameter not? What? Why Slap did it. it stop? Why did it, you know? <laughs> And every single step there are is problems, and you need to adjust to the the new data that you have that time. Oh and, yeah. Um. So constantly massaging the data to make ex- it fit, and exactly. yeah, yeah, right. And then I mean to the point where you produce the exact same data for three different organisms, and then you because of just the genetic makeup of these organisms, you end up having to use different parameters and and run that pipeline in a totally different way. Oh. For example, okay. so it's it becomes yeah biology is literally I think I guess the slogan is their biology is complex. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the fun of it. Right? It is. It yeah. is. Yeah. Okay, so basically we combine all these different um, things where we do field work or aquarium actual experiments, mm. and then we use molecular biology. So we of course then take out the tissues or, or the, of the organisms, and then can't you just like does it have to come from a certain part of the fish? I mean, uh... yes. Yes, so it... Really? Yeah. I thought DNA would be... Uh... Oh, no, because... Sorry. I, yeah, that's why I, I haven't mentioned that yet. So we I'm don't jumping the just gun. Exactly. You are. You're kind of jumping ahead. <laughs> We're not... Don't only study the DNA. Uh, we study the... Um, how the DNA is used, which if in, in rudimentary words means um, uh, RNA and proteins. So we, you know, we have that... that that genome that exists in every of our cells and uh, this genome is basically the same right you're you're given that genome and you're somewhat stuck with it um basically and but you can use that genome in a different way um which means uh, you express genes differently right um, and then these get translated into proteins Yes. And these proteins then can create some kind of physiological response or maybe even a behavioral response. And so basically everything that, that your body is doing or you're almost deciding on, there's some molecular process underneath. Which has been kick-started to... Exactly. Um, so it gets hot, you end up starting to... For example, I don't know. Sweat. Exactly, transpire, and that is then dominated by other processes in your body, which then ha- means that at some point right. there was some gene upregulated or downregulated, well, differentially regulated, right. so that there is this reaction, downstream reaction happening of you transpiring and not not overheating. <laughs> mm. um, and that has nothing to do with you have the same genome you go still go to the arctic place you get cold um, and you end up having a different reaction happening based on the same genome right because you're still the same individual 
Um, so we are looking at this response of how you can utilize the genomic information that you get or have mm. um, to react to an environment. Mm. And uh, this is kind of what we start off with. So for even without the cross generations, we need mm. to understand what what fish or other organisms in the marine environment, how they just basically respond to okay. an environmental change, right. right? So it gets hot because there's a heat wave. We try to understand what, uh, what a fish does. And we un try to understand that uh, across different levels where, for example, we would take um, the liver tissue in this case. Okay. And the reason why we take tissues is different tissues is because they are um, usually um, responsible for different function in your body. Yes. So the liver is a metabolic yep. related tissue yep. and very often with an increase in temperature you would ha need to, to breathe more, right? It's even right. us, we like, you know, yep. you start needing more oxygen yep. um, and so it's usually the more indicative um, tissue for that to look at would be the liver, for example. Is that so? Yeah. And um, we also do this for, for example, if we look at behavior, it would be more the brain. Mm -hmm. um, CO2 um, related issues are kind of gill and brain as well and um, so depending on, on, on what you kind of expect because you can't just like shred up the whole fish and, and look at all the cells at once. You're reverse engineering the source code so, so this is like a reverse engineering so essentially like in the computer if I use an analogy you've got, you've got, uh, you've got an executable uh, you know, I say executable, understanding mm -hmm. the full entity that you know what it is. Yes. So the, compi the compiler outputs uh, mm -hmm. something that your, your machine can execute. Mm -hmm. So your fish, you don't know the source code to it. You've just got an executable and your goal is to try to find the equivalent source code of that. So you do you use uh, techniques to uh, reverse engineer and you've reconstructed the source code, the genome essentially, but you're doing it uh, steps further by actually saying, okay, well, how does this executable or this or this this uh, this genome behave in this environment. So you insert it into warm water, for example. You see how it uh, insert in cold water, like increase the CO2 in this one, decrease the CO2. Okay, what's the effect based on this genome or the source code of this this mm -hmm. individual? Um, how, how does the how does the liver react to that or the brain react to that? Along these lines, mm -hmm. yes. Would that be a good analogy? Yes. Okay. And it does help us then understand what functions are used, right? So right. Um, we know to a certain extent what genes have what function. Okay. So if I then see in our... Cool, um, man, this is really cool what you mean. <laughs> in our transcriptomes, which right. is what, what Wait, the RNA what is, is. Transcriptome. So a tome. Tome. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> the tra okay. Transcription is what... What, um, what the RNA does. A, a, well, yes, basically. So you have the genome and then you, you transcribe certain uh, yeah. parts of the genome yeah. uh, to have RNA. Yeah. And that RNA is, is what we then look at is gene expression. Okay. And that RNA then eventually gets uh, translated into proteins mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. is what we then call the proteome. Right. So if we want to look at what, just in general what happens across the... So without necessarily even needing to know any prior knowledge, yeah. we can use the... Um, the um, so instead of looking at one gene mm. and um, one gene expression and the, and the protein expression of one protein, we look at the gene ohm, mm. <laughs> so all of it. We look at the transcriptome and we look at the proteome. So we look okay. at basically everything that is in that expressed in that cell at that point in time. Good God. Yes. And that's why you have this big data happening because God you, you, you then end up basically sequencing everything and you then have to find out of that, those billions of A, G, C's and T's, you have to find that um, needle in a haystack. But not only that, but you've got a number of other dimensions of data going on, like the proteome and the, and the transcriptome and then but each of these, I mean, like, these are also their own little caves, undiscovered cave systems. Yeah. Am I right? Oh, totally. Completely. Well, oh, there's Jesus another level. Do you want me to add more? <laughs> Go ahead. Like. <laughs> because then we have the epigenome. Oh, this, Scott told me about this. Apparently now we're starting to enter the woo-woo land. Oh. Is that right? <laughs> That's what he told me. 
<laughs> is that? Is it, no, no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. How, I mean, he was like, yeah, there's elements of woo woo ness going on in there. Is that correct? I, I'm not sure if I would. So it depends who you ask, I guess. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so okay. developmental biologists, that's their norm, right? Okay. Um, I don't know what a developmental biologist is. Oh, sorry. It's someone who studies development. <laughs> no, but so basically from when you are... Um, um, uh, an embryo, I would guess, or even, oh, even before I that. Oh, I see, I see. What, how, how you develop over time. Okay. And um, actually, the developmental part is really important to any organism. Mm -hmm. um, because so this involves a lot of stem cells and that sort of thing, is it? Or uh, it could also, yes. Okay, all right, yeah. all right. Yeah, it could. Not, not you, as a developmental biologist, you don't necessarily have to look at, at okay. stem cells. all right. But um, because a lot of our development um, is formed... Or, or a lot of our possibility, it's called it like this, a possibility to react to a certain um, environment is actually formed during development. So you, you, so you, if you grow up, even though you, so let's say you have a twin brother. Yeah. And you have this very similar genome. Yeah. Um, and you grow up in, in a cold environment and the other one grows up in a warm environment. Yeah. And during development, you might get without the aircon. So forget about aircon, right? So actually, be outside. Um, so and so this means that your brother gets used to living in a warm environment. Use a, use a different example. One in space and one in not. This is really in happened. Space. This really happened, hey? They really oh, did this. Heard, there, I, there was a couple of uh, scientists, uh, astronauts, and they were. But but were they? Did they develop though? Did they have their? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. So ah, as adults, we're see. kind of we're kind of stuck with what we got yeah, most of yeah, the time. Yeah. But, you know, we're all very set yeah, in our ways. And yeah. This is behaviorally as well as yeah. physiologically. I'm so. sure it would be child abuse throwing a three-year-old up there in <laughs> yeah, space, yeah. right? Or even younger, right? So, <laughs> or even, yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Yeah, it's more about development. So, and then when we go away from the human, remember that you know. Other other animals, because we are an animal as well. Um, other animals live out with the um, environment completely, right? right? So we have a house and, and we have aircon and we have modify our environment. But a mouse that has the, the same genome than the other mouse and they live in different environments, their development from an uh, embryo might have very different development because of environmental temperature yeah. for one versus the other. And this has nothing to do with... Um, changing the genome it has to do with changing the regulation of the genome is this nature versus nurture kind of stuff yes exactly yeah, yeah that's what the epigenome is about is the oh, is the nurture okay yeah um all so right no wonder he went woo woo <laughs> <laughs> okay all right but it's a fascinating it is, oh, area yeah. right now because yeah. okay. the, like i said it's not necessarily like it's not there's nothing magical about it um, because there have been scientists that really have focused on this right. quite a lot mm. um, and development is a massive part of, of any of our you know also sure. diseases and things sure. like that it's super important mm. so they've been studying this for a long time it's just never been applied to more ecological um, contexts or to evolutionary biology to be honest so there's been this um, <laughs> how do you even apply how do you go about applying it that, that to you, evolutionary biology you realize that it's not just about the genome so this is where my where my <laughs> area comes in because we look at what happens within one generation yeah, right? okay. so within an organism and we understand our or the organism's capabilities to mm. respond okay and what functions do they use how much are they struggling how right. how much does it help to um like to to be exposed to this environment during the whole development right so how how capable does it make them in their own lifetime to deal with that environmental uh, factor and um in evolutionary terms while we never think about an individual it still has to be the individual that is fittest that reproduces right to end up creating an evolutionary process. Oh, yeah, 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 so yeah. if if you're kind of all screwed in your own lifetime, then you're never going to reproduce. Um, but if some are more capable of dealing in their lifetime with an environmental change, they are more likely to actually um, reproduce to the next generation. Mm. And these are more, and that means that that kind of gene pool is then, or those individuals are the ones that are passing on their genes. 
So it's a combination. It's not so plain, um, especially for longer lived individuals like fish, yeah. for example. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you have some fish that start reproducing at the age of 15, for example. Some yeah. of the grouper species that yeah, we yeah, love yeah. here in Hong Kong. The potato yeah. fish, right? Um, that that's, a, could, that's a big one, isn't it? Yes. I think so, so. Th we have, yeah, so a lot of these have qu a quite long lived, right? Yes. So 50, 60 years might be their lifetime. Oh. Um, and so in general, that means that um, a lot will happen during their lifetime in yeah. terms of environmental change. <laughs> so if they're not capable of dealing with that, then, you know, they're, they're done anyways. Well, like so, the orangutan. Uh, it takes like 10 years to, to teach a, a youngster, like, you know, where to get the good fruit, you know, where's, where's the, where to get the water, you know, all that stuff. That ten, well, 10 solid years, that. Well, how long does it take us humans to do anything? <laughs> we are literally the <laughs> slowest of all of us, all of the animals out there. <laughs> yeah, true. We're I mean, born uh, immature, <laughs> premature, and, you know, nurtured until 21 years old. And like, get out of the house, <laughs> goddammit. <laughs> true. Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so it's a bit of a combination where um, it's not just the genome that determines how fit you are, mm. right? So we always think about evolution as the uh, survival of the fittest, which doesn't mean that you worked out more at the gym or anything. It just meant, it means that your, your genetics provides you with um, uh, certain advantages over others. Yeah. And those advantages, because you are at an advantage, you are the one that's more reproducing. Mm. Um, and then that means that this um, genome or this genetic material will be passed on more and more and more. And that is basically what evolution is about. That you uh, not necessarily create all kinds of new crazy things. It's just that you, um, you have already genetic material available that then with an environmental change ends up um, moving towards a certain direction, mm. right? So that's what we call natural selection. And but of course, this natural selection doesn't just happen like I just explained or tried to explain at least. I hope um, on on the genetic material, but it, it's about you or the organism being able to use that material, that genetic material, to deal with the environmental change. Have I lost you completely? No, 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 no. I, I'm. I okay. So. So it's a mix so, like, okay, between so there's nature not, and a, nurture. Yeah, it's not. A, it's not. A, it's not like a conscious thing of like. Yeah, okay. Maybe it could be. It's like. Like. No, what do you mean with conscious thing? Well, I mean, one doesn't consciously use one's DNA, right? I mean. Exactly. It's like yeah, yeah. let me enable that superpower. No, it doesn't happen. It's no. just. It's just. It's just. Well, I can handle the heat better than you, kind of thing, or I can adapt to it. Like, Okay, for example, yeah, the, is that right? What you're kind of thinking about is more of a, uh, well, probably like a behavioral adaptation. So, okay, then I'm, I've missed, okay, then you need to expand on what you mean. Okay, so there can be different types of adaptation uh, where you are either just uh, physio, no, structurally more fit. Um, so let's right. say in a population of um, Arctic foxes. You have um, some one. some that, <laughs> that are born. I know where you're gonna go. Some that are born very with white fur, and others that are born with a bit more brown fur, uh, just yeah. because of their genetic material. Mm -hmm. And maybe then the white fur ones can hide more in yeah. this in the snow, and the brown ones or the brownier-ish ones are are um, have some more issues with predators or um, yeah. So or are heat up too much because of certain other um, mechanisms of yeah. keeping cool because of white fur. Anyways, I'm, I'm getting also on the white. What I'm trying to say is that you generally have variation in a population. Yes. So in this case, you would have, for example, fur color. But isn't that just, that's just standard evolution, that's what we're talking there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's just standard evolution. Yes. I think I've got my finger. I think I've okay, got my... Okay, but that's structural. The, okay, so that's structural. Okay, okay, yeah, that's so structural. They, they don't make a choice in terms of, no, I, I, I no, want no, more. Exactly. I'm going to go get yeah. my, my fur colored. Um, <laughs> No, it's, it's just what you get, definitely. Yeah. And then you also have the physiological response, right. physiological adaptation, where, like we said before, you transpire when, when it's too hot, for example. Right, right. And this is something where some bodies are more capable of dealing with that, and some are not. Mm -hmm. So again, variation within mm -hmm. the population. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is a behavioral one, right? So it's somewhat, I'm not sure if you can call it decisions, but... 
um, because that's very like a human perspective, right? But some might be uh, capable of, of escaping a predator more than others because even with a yeah, change okay. in the environment. Okay, so, so like for example, I get hangry. I make sure I eat before an indaba because... <laughs> Okay, that, that is a, that's like, a like behavioral some, response. No, but some people can handle it. Some people can handle being hungry better than I can. You know, my my mm -hmm. wife, for example, I become a I, Sebastian. He's got a terminology. I was we we went to, to China one day, and and he he, I I, I, I we hadn't eaten all all morning and afternoon, and we were going from lab to lab, and and I just sort of sat down. I said, oh, "That's it. I'm fucking th uh, just out of the blue, right? We're going to that restaurant now." Um, and he was like, what's, what's the matter, dude? I'm like, I'm starving, you know? Like, I became really hangry at that point. Like, hungry and angry combined yeah. together. Anyway. Yeah, so you are, yeah. you're probably less taller. I mean, that the, this would be like a human physiology be response to, or, to thinking about your sugar levels are probably dropped. Mm -hmm. And that's when you have a different behavioral response to it. It's is this really complex. Is this entering the domain of what you're talking about? Uh, but possibly, because you do have variation within the population where some people yeah, can okay. deal better with um, starvation. Or, I mean, right. you know, starvation, starvation is a maybe good word. different thing. It's a good word. <laughs> it's a good word, because that's what was happening to me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Versus other people who deal with that um, right. um, better. Okay. And then again, this might be either due to genetics or possibly also kind of this maybe epigenetic factor in there mm. be because of how you maybe developed mm. maybe you always had food and you had a very regular Damn way of, of getting of, <laughs> of getting your sugar and <laughs> your blood sugar and you know whereas other people might yeah. have been okay with skipping meals or not had irregular meals and they're just more not used to it <laughs> yeah <Not this> one. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah. so it it could be genetic as mm. well as as regulatory. That's something okay. that during development you you not learned behaviorally, but I your see. your your cells basically learned. How how do you test for that in fish? We can talk about it now as human beings. <laughs> yes, it's but how fish do you are way more fun anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so how do we test uh, for this? So we look at, um, like I said, different regulatory mechanisms of, of how we use the genome. Mm. So one of them is, is RNA, for example. Let's, okay. let's stick with that one. That there's, mm. different, there's different levels. Mm. Um, and then, so what we look at then is what genes are differentially expressed um, and what genes are not. So you've, you've developed your own markers. In this case, because we're looking at the transcriptome, we are basically just sequencing all the RNA that's in the cell okay. or in that tissue. Okay. We're okay. not selecting in this case. Okay. Because what we want to know first up is the whole general response because we're not, we don't know. We don't have any previous knowledge. Mm -hmm. right? So then we go across the, the whole um, genome to mm -hmm. look at what genes are expressed and what are not. And okay. then we see, we usually compare everything in science is compared to a control. So we compare this fish that is exposed to uh, um, different levels of CO2 in the tank to um, not just one, right? It's replicates. We then yeah. have individuals or samples um, yeah. that have a certain treatment. And then we compare that with control. So right. the one that is in, in the environmental condition that we would expect nowadays yeah. out mm. in the in marine environment. So, and then we compare these two and then we see, okay, some genes are differentially expressed. So basically they're differentially regulated in the ones that are exposed to the elevated CO2. Mm. And then we go and have a look what functions these genes have. And then we can look at, okay, yeah, you have, um, you know, a immune response or mm. you have um, a response to moving ions around the tissues uh, to deal with with uh, like a chemical regulation you, you have um all kinds of different functions that you can then look at and then understand what the fish actually does to deal with um the co2 okay and that's kind of a first step right but just that just that in itself sounds like fucking magical <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like like how do you how do you see these ions? I mean, like I mean, like you know, looking at ion traps is one thing, but like you know, how you how, how do you know that they're freaking shuttling around there? All our databases. 
that's where our databases come in. So all the data that we collect in terms of how, what genes do or the, you know, the genomes, the transcriptomes, oh, the proteins, okay. all these things, they're all stored in our databases. And then we understand that this gene, because let's say there's a conserved gene that we have in mice and humans and Drosophila, uh, which is a fruit fly, um, in all kinds of other organisms. Yeah. And we know, okay, the function of these genes generally is oh, to regulate our circadian rhythm, for example. Um, so we, en we end up knowing the function of a gene um, to a certain extent because very often we haven't studied it in, in, the, in our fish, right? So, so for example, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, like the circadian rhythms, mm -hmm. like um, hydroponics, you can, you, can, you can put more light onto these hydroponic plants. You would be able to determine uh, the circadian rhythm shift change? Yes. Uh, okay, okay, okay. And that's actually something that we surprisingly. Why, this is my. This is how I like um, sneakily went over to that topic ha because ha it's something that we surprisingly found in our fish. We did oh, not right. think of that before, to be honest. So there wasn't the hypothesis to mm. be like circadian rhythms are affected by CO two, but we ended up finding that in our data pretty. Okay, clearly. so this is this is this <laughs> is like like a restaurant would have a signature dish. Would this be your signature? Dish? Not yet. Uh, it is. Uh, no, I, I probably, it's probably a bit too Sounds narrow. Sounds good, huh? Come the, on. The, the dish. <laughs> you, can, you can sell yourself, you know. I'm <laughs> no, sure oh, people will come I, to your restaurant. Oh, I, <laughs> I, I find that topic highly interesting, and we've been working on it for a while now. Um, and we're definitely digging much deeper into yeah, it. Yeah, okay. Um, I just submitted a grant application last week to be able to work on that um, in more Ooh. detail. Yeah. Um, but I, I think there's more just going on than just the circadian rhythm, I have to admit. But it is a really important um, important factor. I don't, does everybody know what a circadian rhythm is? Oh, that's a good point. Yes, that's yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, okay. You, you explain what a circadian rhythm is. Well, it's, it's something that in, in all organisms, so there's plants, like you said, hydroponics and, and animals as well, that dominates um, our cycle. Mm. <laughs> And mostly over about a 24-hour cycle, where we have certain processes that are active mm. or not active during day and night. So uh, uh, for a human, for example, in the morning you wake up, sometimes without an alarm clock. Well, that's due to the circadian uh, rhythm telling you that it's now time to wake up, which is usually influenced by the light that you receive. And then you have a chemical process of then your body activating your metabolism and you start waking up. And over the day, you then end up, you know, um, being particularly active at certain hours. And then during the night, when the light goes down, you usually become a little bit more um, like calm unless mm. we influence ourselves with other things. <laughs> 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 and your metabolism starts shutting down and you end up realizing, OK, it's time to sleep. And then you go to sleep. Mm. Um, and generally that goes over a 24 hour cycle and um, this happens with organisms naturally everywhere most of them so plants you know they open their um, their flowers at a certain time um, because that's when the sun is out how do they know that well circadian rhythms um, and uh, i mean animals other kinds of animals the same thing right they react to um, um over a 24 hour cycle to right to a you know any kind of stimulus in the environment okay um but usually we think of it mostly as light and then secondarily uh, the the environment that influences it is temperature okay so light and temperature are both things that can kind of determine your circadian rhythm what we now know <laughs> is that in fish um apparently uh, co2 or ph um, whichever you want of both of them they go hand in hand um, influences their circadian rhythm regulation. We are studying this in more and more detail now that so we can understand more mm -hmm. and I, ca I can make more bold statements next time maybe but <laughs> um, basically uh, the, um, to think about well, if the light changes or the temperature changes for other organisms then you also have kind of a disruption to, the, to that rhythm, the clock basically, your natural clock. An adaptation. 
Uh, no, that's not an adaptation. It's just no. You're new... adapting to the new change. Oh yes, okay. you will start. In that sense, yeah. You would start. So let's think about a human. We go travel before when travel yeah. was still possible. Mm -hmm. Then uh, <laughs> you go somewhere. <laughs> you go somewhere and. Um, all of a sudden, it's a different time of day, right? Time zone, yeah. And Sean, you, you get gotta, this yeah. jet lag. Mm. This jet lag is caused by a disruption to the circadian clock that you have. Okay. Because your circadian clock was set to Hong Kong time, and now you're somewhere else, and this time is very confusing, right? For and your some body. people can handle jet lag like that. I cannot. Yeah. I, oh, okay. I have the worst jet lags. Yes. Oh, is that so? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't mind it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, lucky you. Lucky you. So, see how this variation is there? I see. So, apparently, I regulate my circadian, with, not decisively, but my circadian rhythm is pretty set, whereas your circadian rhythm might not be as set and is a bit more flexible. So, this ep ep epigenics? Ep epigenetics. Epigenetics. Yeah. Epigenetics. It's like how much overlap on is it? like on top of genetics, right? Yeah, okay, epigenetics. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, you're a good teacher. You have made associations <laughs> I'm, there. I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying myself <laughs> at it right now. You so. help me there. Okay, so this epigenetics, how uh, coupled with um, this? Uh, no, I won't say sleep cycle. Um, this uh, what was that? Uh, circadian? circadian rhythms. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. How, how coupled with the circadian rhythms is it? Is it is it like wait so what, what so just like you said the CO two and the and and the and the and the and the pH of water is very, like synonymous or mm -hmm. the same thing um, this uh, epigenetics uh, coupled with the circadian rhythms I mean mm, so epigenetics does more than that there okay. there are some processes that are involved in okay. the circadian rhythm for right, sure right. but. Um, Epigenetics much more, right? right it's not, okay. It doesn't just regulate some of the circadian. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So, so the fish. So how did you stumble across? Well, not stumble. How did you come across oh, this? Actually, to be honest, in this case, it pretty much was stumbling. It was a stumble. It's somewhat. Yes. Was that so? So uh, oh, I'd love we, to hear the we story. had created this uh, experiment, which was answering in general uh, to understand some of the first responses and also how these responses might be passed on uh, to the okay. next generation All right, okay. in fish um, okay. to, in reaction to, well, let's call it ocean acidification, right? So this okay. is the bigger word. When we talk about CO2 or pH, it might be so abstract, but ocean acidification is what's going, or it is happening and what will happen in the future to the oceans as they become more acidic. Right. So we're essentially trying to uh, understand the responses to that ocean acidification. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we did that within a generation and then across a generation. Okay. And then we look at all the RNA, once again, so in, in, in the tissue, right? Yeah. And then we, we basically can see what genes are differentially expressed. And we didn't necessarily hypothesize about that before, no. We were expecting it to be more iron homeostasis, other kinds of function to be related in it because okay. that's what we would know from the previous uh, data or what we mm -hmm. know from fish physiology. Mm -hmm. But we found, um, surprisingly, um, that the circadian rhythm was highly affected by, by a change in, in ocean acidification. In, in, yeah, okay. CO2. And that then made us think more and actually go to kind of the next step where we realized that um, Actually, this kind of makes sense. <laughs> so, on the, cor at the in a coral reef environment, you have um, corals uh, that transpire and respire. So, co corals are transpire uh, in the sense of of, uh, so, uh, um, yeah. the equivalent no. of breathing. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so, sorry, that was a, the wrong word. But so, what? Uh, corals are are coral are are this mix of um, it's well, a hybrid they are animals. algae and uh, well not not it's not a hybrid you, yeah that's there's, uh, there's two organisms there hey exactly so it's a oh um, I know what you mean by symbiosis. not a hybrid yes yeah. somebody I think that's the word that's as the a, word as a, as a geneticist the <laughs> hybrid is actually a proper cross of, of two genomes basically. yes I know right? that's so, why yes okay. and that's why you you corrected me and thank yes. you very much that's that's <laughs> yes yes uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, and so basically there's photosynthesis that happens um, as, uh, during the day and respiration that happens during the night um, yes. because of, of the different organisms um, like being active, right? Mm. And that means that <coughs> CO2 is being produced or being taken up, Yes. depending on the time of day. 
So wait a second. Time of day. Well, so sorry. Time of day, day or night. Day or night. Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. And so we were like, hmm, maybe we should have a look and see what happens on a on a coral reef. And we did see in the end, measuring it, that you do have a bit of a pH fluctuation. Oh right. Okay. Generally. Because okay. Yes. So naturally, in okay. in certain environments, and apparently in coral reefs, it's it's a little bit only. In other places, you have larger fluctuations. Um, so you already have somewhat of a, we can call that adaptation, I guess, um, uh, adaptation to living in a in fluctuating pHs. And for some organisms or some part of the population, uh, they are quite flexible with dealing with that, whereas the other part of the population are not so flexible in dealing with that. So the second part kind of has their circadian rhythms a bit disrupted by Would you find them on the edges of the coral reef? <laughs> no, no. They live all together in the oh, okay. same population. All right. <laughs> Just wondering. <laughs> yes. No, that, 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 that could have been a gin-influenced uh, oh, yeah, extrapolation no, that, going would, on it's there. Not a, there's, a, no, there's literally no, no question is a bad question, right? Because No, no, um, I know. I know. It, there might be a behavioral adaptation for them to like try and escape, but then again, ocean acidification is going to affect um, everything yeah, across it's the be scales, a blanket, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, the little amount of, of fluctuations on the reef will just no, I, th I, th I thought you were talking, the, I thought you were mentioning the, the, the fluctuations were, I will try to string together this sentence. Okay. Um, yes, we're not, we're not, I'm, I, I thought you were referring to the, the natural sort of uh, um, cycles of the, P, uh, of the, of the carbon dioxide going yes. through the, the environment. And you, yes. and you said, based on this natural uh, cycle, um, there are certain organisms that can adapt to it. Much better than others, or certain or better than part others. of the population. Let's say so. Oh, certain, population, say, the same population that you're testing, organism, right? So same ah, fish, okay, okay. Same fish. Some, ah, uh, some are, see, are already kind of more okay, adapted to oh, that's the key. to deal to to going with the fluctuations. That's right? where I misunderstood. Just like you I and me, and, I understand and, now. and yeah. you with the jet lag, and me with or right. you not not needing to wake up in the middle of the night when you have a jet lag. <coughs> Forgive me, I thought they were different species, and not for a second there. Yeah, so so just. Just focusing on even the same species. Okay. You have some that can deal with that a bit better yeah. and some that don't. Okay. And then if you increase the CO2 level, which means ocean acidification, yeah. you then end up having much more differential responses to it. So okay. one part of the population can deal with it a bit better and the other part can't. Just can't, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And um, yeah, so we kind of studied this. Uh, you see there's this variation in there again that then end up it can end up creating what we call the kind of true natural selection right so what we think about it the variation will end up the the ones that survive will end up passing on their genes etc yes, etc yes. this is what we think of as evolution yeah um but again it is important to understand how the organism during its lifetime is capable of dealing with no some i of see the changes. okay so Within these sorts of an ecological systems, there's, I think they're called keystone, capstone, keystone individuals? Yes. Is it yeah. keystone? Is that oh, the right word? Oh, there's different words. Umbrella species, keystone. I is, is it keystone? Yeah. Okay, so a keystone is, is, is for example, uh, uh, in the case of um, uh, the kelp forests, mm -hmm. um, you get your sea urchins who, mm -hmm. if you don't have sea otters, the sea urchins are going to go wild mm -hmm. and then as a result they eat just the kelp and then the kelp just sort of like you know disappears and then it becomes like you know whoop no more kelp so so the 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 sea otter would be a keystone individual or, or, or spe uh, species species is yes. that correct yes so it could you could you mm -hmm. apply the same research do you think it would be a good idea i'm not maybe you're already doing it but i'm just inferring uh, uh, taking this this knowledge or this technique that you've got of, of mm -hmm. with a new knowledge of this uh, pH influencing the circadian rhythms and apply it to ke uh, keystone individuals within the, 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 the coral reef, which would then be able to allow you to make certain predictions about oceanif oceanif oceanification? Ocean acidification. Ocean acidification. <laughs> Acidification of the ocean. There we go. Okay. Ocean <laughs> acidification. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, I mean, in a sense, we're probably already doing it. 
Um, I'm not sure if, if well, it's not necessarily focused just on the circadian rhythms, right? So this is one uh, kind of key finding and an important finding that we, okay. that we need to dig into All more. Right. But um, there are key species that w might have, if they disappear, let's say, or if they don't yep. know how to react um, or be able to deal with an environmental change. It's a one-way door. If they disappear, then we have a, a cascading effect. I guess yes. that's what it is. Some species can disappear, and then, of course, we don't have that biodiversity, and it's it's still detrimental in a... In, in certain ways, but some have yeah. a bit more of a larger effect, right. depending on the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So usually a coral reef ecosystem has so many different factors, right? We have just a breadth of variety of organisms that live there. Mm. Um, you don't necessarily have just one key species, um, uh, just like in a, in a, in a kelp system, there's still not enough species, but it's probably less less diverse than a, a, a coral reef, right? But I, I can tell you about one other fun study that uh, we work with, one other uh, great organism. I would organism love to hear it. <laughs> is, um, it's the cleaner ras. Have you ever... Have yes, you, have I, you know, ever? I know what... So cleaner ras are those... those okay, so, so like, you know, turtles or something would, would, would come in from like the open ocean for a bit of a, you know, uh, this is like the tropical island, you know, maybe they want to get <laughs> catch a margarita on the beach and then they go there and they sort of sit down and like some fish would come and clean them uh, and, yeah, and exactly. chew off all the... Yes. Is that, uh, that's the cleaner ass, is that co yes. correct? Yes. I, I, yeah. I probably at that stage would say that the, the mama turtle to trying to lay the eggs on the beach is like, has gone through migration. She's like starved. Oh, sure. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, okay, let's have that analogy of, of the turtle coming. Um, yes, so clean Sharks then. Sharks do the same thing, I think. Do they? Um, um, maybe, I can't remember. Um, not sure how much they would get clean, to be honest. But even like larger predator fish and things like that, for sure. Okay. Um, so the cleaner ras is a relatively small ras mm -hmm. on the reef, mm -hmm. and if you go out in Hong Kong and you snorkel nowadays, you can actually have seen quite a few uh, actually diving, but I think you might see them uh, snorkeling as well. And uh, it's it's a very clever fish. I, I love it. It's <laughs> very amazing uh, species to study. Um, this cleaner ras. Uh, cleans other organisms, right? So you see fish and turtles and, and other other things. Uh, mainly it's other fish, to be honest, because mm -hmm. we don't have that many turtles here. So, um, And uh, so the reason why it does this is so that when it cleans other fish, it takes off the parasites, mm -hmm. ectoparasites, what mm -hmm. we call them, and which means it feeds, basically. And the fish need it because they need to get rid of the parasites, yep. right? So there's a symbiotic... Um, and they want the nutrition. Uh, symbiotic, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Symbiotic relationship there. Um, but the cleaner fish has developed this, um, and probably evolved, you can say, into a, a very um, intelligent organism. Because it makes a lot of choices. So the cleaner ras has, usually has a cleaner station which is also really fun to see when you go diving. You see that there's always that same fish or, or a couple of fish. Sometimes there are a couple or a harem even, so several organisms, uh, several oh, I, fish. I'm, or I'm already starting to like this. Species. Yeah, oh, it's lovely. <laughs> and um, and it kind of, the fish come around and decide, okay, I need to get cleaned. I'm going to go to the cleaner station, I guess. I'm humanizing here. Again. Yeah, 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 no, that's fine. See? And <laughs> uh, and then they kind of make this dance and then they go sideways and, and say, here, come clean me. And the cleaner fish makes this dance um, and decides, okay, I'm gonna, I'm friendly, I'm gonna go clean you. And there's some com communication between them, and then there's this cleaner process, the cleaning process happening. And the cleaner ras can then decide many different things. It can decide, okay, I'm just gonna clean and be, a, you know, nice fish here and just do my job and clean so that this um, fish comes back. Fascinating. So that we call it the client, right? right so, that, yeah, so that the yeah. client comes back. This is like a Ferengi in the Star Wars, <laughs> a Star, Tre <laughs> uh, Star Trek thing. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> and and it can also be really big fish. It can be a predator that it could actually eat the cleaner ras, right? Because right. the cleaner ras is this big, mm. and the cleaner ras also goes inside mouths and cleans them. Yeah. So in that case, probably the the most uh, sensible decision is to not bite it, right? Yeah. So it makes the decision every time, depending on the client and depending on how hungry it is, probably, and depending on what it needs that day, uh, how to treat each and one of those clients. Because apart from biting them, which would mean you get a bit more of a chunk and you eat more, right? Mm. But then the client is never coming back. Mm. Or you just clean it 
uh, like um, diligently. Oh, what? They would actually take a bite out of the client. Oh yeah, I can. Of course. Yeah. Oh, little shits. Yeah, exactly. And um, <laughs> and uh, and then the third option. I mean, it's not just three options, but to just kind of categorize it. The third option would be to even give them a massage. So it uses usually it's kind of um, back tail yeah. to to touch the the client fish a little yeah. bit and massage okay. the skin so that the the client gets a few endorphins out of it and then oh, yeah. it's just more relaxed and stays longer and you, then the cleaner can can feed more right so you have this this whole different levels of interaction mostly determined by the the cleaner ass that's do I bite do I provide more you know, enjoyment, uh, do I want this client to come back? Am I scared of this client? Or um, there are two clients coming in, this one looks like it's got more parasites on it kind of exactly. thing, Exactly, those, so those kinds of things are, are a, a somewhat of a choice to this fish. Fascinating. And probably because of um, its evolution over time in, in doing these things, um, it's one of the first fish that has um, been found to pass what we call the mirror test. Okay, so this is like a Turing test in my domain. Um, what is the mirror test? Is uh, a oh, test you look at the mirror. I, I think I know this yes. before. Yeah, yeah. Okay, looks at the mirror and is able to. to it, wait. It's it's a test for self awareness. Awareness. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like apes can do that. Yeah. Exactly. So for now, it's birds and uh, and primates yeah, that yeah, have yeah, been yeah, yeah. and passing the mirror test. Yeah. And of course, there's a bit of a discussion if the mirror test is valid for a fish. So you know, let's put that aside. But generally, it is such a clever fish that at least there is a bit of a debate about if it probably um, might self-recognize itself. The whole test is in doubt in this case because fish live in water and there's all kinds of complications yeah, about it. But um, so do, do, does it become territorial about about? Oh yes. Oh yes. So oh, so it's it a cleaning, cleaning station. station. Its cleaning station yeah. is like territory. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. Don't mess with my territory. Oh, for sure. So when you present a mirror, it goes like, hey hey. Oh well. No. I'm ready, and then <laughs> and then it's like, okay, that's <laughs> no. that's just me. Okay, and then continues off. Is <laughs> no. that right? Well, it's not that simple, obviously, okay. right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, it, you have to test certain certain things so you see that it actually recognizes that it's. It. Well, how do you test? No. How do you how do you check that? A, like a freaking. I, I'm not an expert on mirror tests. Okay. It's behavior, <laughs> behavioral. I call it or behavioral um, animal behavior studies. Right. And uh, that focus on this. And like I said, uh, it's it might not be. Um, because a mirror is then also based on visuals, right? So it, yeah. it's a bit of a complication when an, a bird versus a fish might not have the same visual capacity just because of their eyes, right, uh, et cetera, right, right. et cetera. So, but let's just ha think of it as that it's the first fish that was ever to even pr be proposed to possibly right. uh, acknowledge itself. Fascinating, <laughs> fascinating. And it, it has really developed... Um, um, so many strategies, right? So it's kind of like economic theory, uh, <laughs> where you can think about now I get more food, should I buy it, should I do this? So it is really thinking economically. Yeah, resources <laughs> and trading, doing it. It's exactly. a good business fish. It's <laughs> yeah, a good business yes. fish. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we study this this fish. Um, mm. Yeah. What did you? So what did what, what, so you? Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, we <laughs> so don't. So that was the general story about the cleaner yeah. ass. Yeah. And why uh, you you asked me about key keystone species? Right. This um, sounds like one of them, right? It is a very important species yeah. because when they've seen uh, or when uh, some other uh, biologist kind of took um, the cleaner wrasses away from a smaller reef. How rude! I Continue. Know. We do. We do some. <laughs> no, but you need to do that stuff. sort of thing. But yeah, I so know. So otherwise, we wouldn't know, right? Um, so what happened then over time is that um, uh, that that reef um, had a forty percent reduction in fish diversity. Fascinating. So the fish need to have. So we don't know, of course, either if they died or they went somewhere else because they were looking for for the. Oh cleaner, yeah, right? good point. Does so it does it matter? No, not really. It means that this fish is uh, the Rhinia ras is really important, and the service that it provides to other fish clearly is important to the diversity in on a reef in terms of um, fish. Absolutely, okay. I see. So you could call it a, a keystone species. Right. Yes. Um, well, 40%, I mean, that, that's, that's a pretty... 
Yeah, it's it, again. It's just. Is that the study? Is that the? Is that what you came up with? Is that the? No, no. Okay. Oh, okay. This is what my studies are based on. See, this is how science works. All of your information is then out there, and then you're like, oh, this guy is really important, right? Mm. So we study certain um, mechanisms in in certain fish species for mm -hmm. particular reasons, but this one was like, okay, I think we really need to be looking at this guy, because um, so one of the the large factors that have been seen in, in, in fish um, is with ocean acidification is that actually some of their behaviors are, are modified. And so remember, you can either like react physiologically, yes, yes, which yes. You, can, you can deal with the CO2 yeah. change or um, some can't, but uh, there's also How a bit of... How does the Kinaras re react to... Well, that was my question then. So we actually studied a different fish first and looked at their behavior and okay. saw that they have variation in their behavior to CO2. Why did you choose to choose that, that other species and not go directly for the Kinaras? Because the Control? other species is, is um, has become a bit of a... Um, a a well-studied fish in coral reef systems. So you wanted to add more information about that fish to that uh, to the body of knowledge. Is that correct? That would be one side. The other side is that you are, we are able to breed it, um, because many coral reef fish, it's like oh Die, my it's god, difficult to, oh I yes. see. Okay, so you got okay, okay, a, okay. And I wouldn't know how to. I wish I knew, and I will try, but I don't know how to breed the cleaner ras. It's complicated. Most coral reef fish are complicated to breed. So, and because you do cross-generational studies, you need a fish that has somewhat uh, ca ca capacity to hold them in tanks and they don't all die on you, right? Or yeah. imagine you do a two year, uh, of the first two years they start breeding and then everything dies on you. And good then you're, God. you're- Oh, good God. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> so good God. Oh. you start, th it's, so it's a mix of um, that it was a very common fish on the reef. Um, um, or also worldwide on, on yeah. most reefs, mm. but also the capability of breeding in, in, in tanks. Plus all the previous knowledge that existed in terms of its ecology that was right, there. Right, right, so right. So that's how you kind of choose your, your organism. Okay. But then you go from that and you learn something about it. And we learn things like the circadian rhythm and, and, and yep. that um, actually if your parents are previously exposed to the elevated CO2, then you're doing much better. Um, as an offspring than if your parents have not uh, seen that CO2 previously. Okay. So we learn these kinds of things that we have what we call transgenerate or intergenerational effects or parental right. effects. So the environment in previous generations is important for you in the next generations. Right, okay. And so we learn these things and then of course you can use that knowledge and be like, okay, now I'm looking for other organisms and I want to extrapolate it more to other species or then to keystone species mm. or yeah, other other kinds of um, organisms. Right. And that's where the kind of cleaner has fascinated me. Um, so, uh, so is this what the application of your next uh, funding grant is, is for or, or you have already done the research into the cleaner rats? We've done some of that research. Ah, okay. And um, what, what is it public? You don't want to let the cat out the bag? We, have, or? we haven't published it yet. Oh, no. so then you don't want to talk about it or no, there's an element of... No, we can talk a little bit about it. It's okay. probably still a bit in the making. Um, okay. So it's not as... Um, is is, is the cleaner rats a hot, hot, hot uh, fish to study? You know? For me, it is, no, but I mean, I mean, it's not necessarily like everybody okay. wants to study the cleaner ras. No. Okay. Um, but the cleaner ras has been used a lot um, uh, in neurological studies as well, right? Holy, um, why? Oh, because of the, uh, the decision making. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's why it's really nice to kind of connect it now with we're doing this molecular part mm. and, and adding the environmental part. Mm. Um, and we can also then understand how. Um, an environmental change like CO2 can actually affect you neurologically, right? Oh, okay. So are you going to um, maybe have less brain regions uh, be active? Are you going to have um, basically less activity in the brain because of certain environmental conditions, which is actually not unlikely that it might happen. So. So. Okay. So this influence of the circadian rhythms was discovered firstly in in fish by you 
well, in combination with the circadian rhythms. In combination. Uh, uh, ocean acidification, sorry, yes. That's correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Circadian so, rhythms haven't been so, discovered, but okay, there's, okay. A, there's a... No, 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 no. There's that's, a Nobel that's, Prize that's, one no, for that. No, no, so no. <laughs> That's not what I meant. Yeah. I, I meant uh, the pH, the pH or the uh, ocean acidification in, in relation to the circadian rhythms. Um, this is very interesting information. Has it been applied to land-dwelling people or land-dwelling organisms? Have have we looked? Has it, has has this sort of like spawned off any further research domains into this area? I don't think it's spawned it off from my particular research, but there is um, research in, ter in circadian rhythms on land animals, in particular things Frogs. like light, light pollution. So oh, okay. for a lot of... No, but that's light or, light or temperature. Yes. That, that, oh, the, CO2. The, no. Those are the two boring ones. Now we've we got, we got to do CO2 oh, now. Okay. That's, yes. that's where I all the hot not, stuff is now. I have not heard of that oh, being done on land animals. Okay. Frogs might be a good one. Because of the, the skin can absorb. Maybe, yeah. Anyway, now now we're now we're into now we're into many millions of research money coming in. Oh uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to expand this. <laughs> who, yeah. who am I talking to here? Right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like yeah, yeah, F frogs or, or or salamander. That sort of that sort of mm. individual might be interesting. That would be really quite interesting to see. Okay, so the cleaner ass. Yes. Uh, you, you, okay, we we. The cleaner rats. How so far, how far what, are we going to go? What would I want to tell you about the cleaner rats? Yeah. So um, we can probably say that um, it's fascinating. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But also what we did with the cleaner rats, which was quite cool, is that we, um, we study different brain regions in this case. Mm. So we're going at also more fine scale. Uh -huh. So um, just like you develop things over time, you start going from whole tissues to finer tissues. Yes, yes, parts yes, yes. And and um, what we did was we exposed the cleaner ras as well as one of its potential clients to um, future near future CO two levels, right? So something that would happen in like shit. What was the what was the reaction? <laughs> and then we let them react and yes. we filmed their behavior, and then we took out their brains, which is you know what. No, no, no. Let's 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 not get all you oh, know okay. like you know. I, let's I have just to jump you know, the two conclusions already. Yeah, no, we're not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we don't... Like, this is science. I mean, yeah. let's take the emotions on the side. And yeah. try, well, well, I suppose we're connecting with the general... Poor fish, poor yeah. fish. Okay, now yeah. let's continue. Yes, so we took their brain out and uh, then sequenced yes. each of their regions mm -hmm. to look at their transcriptome and some epigenetic part. Yep. Um, and the transcriptome basically shows us that, um, first of all, um, we just had to look at ha what happens when the cleaner and the client interact yes. and when they're not interacting, right? Because okay. we didn't even have that data. Okay. We don't have information on that because that's never been studied on the molecular level. Right. So Shit, how do you even do that? How do you even do we that? We let them interact and then we take their brains out. So wait, 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 wait a second. Behavior. So, so, so as, as they're busy interacting and, and you can see they're sort of like, you know, rubbing up against each other, then you put a basically you kill them both. Exactly. At, at the moment, but uh, then don't you think somewhat, they're gonna? Don't yes. you think they're gonna uh, like experience the pain of death, adapting to the new scenario of dying, as opposed to you know we, cleaning? We kill them pretty fast. So. Oh shit! Yes. So we're talking about effective forms of killing then. Oh yes, yes. Uh, uh, electrocution. This is, and this is not just because of. Um, is it electrocution? No, it. Even. We. There's different ways of, of killing fish, but because we work on the molecular level, we can't use any um, anesthesia. Okay. Because it might influence that. So you, you just basically just cut, cut their the spine. The spi ah, yeah, that would be an effective way. Yeah, and the effective way is is quite because important. you don't even have an op opportunity to uh, send adaptive signals in there. But then how, how do how, how do you do it in such so quickly that like it even grabbing it it would. That is true, but we would grab all of them, right? And then we compare them. Ah, so okay. in the end, the grabbing will be the same of the. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Right, right. <laughs> that, that sounded weird. It but did. It did. It did. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. But <laughs> this is not. This is not. Uh, you know. This is PG eighteen. <laughs> okay. okay. Good. <laughs> I do not. Uh, yes. I am. Um, later, I'm, I will get all my my research permits, uh, ethic permits. Like uh, you, you're grabbing. For, well, you know. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. So. Um, so basically, you, you, then then you're able to you're able to basically get. Uh, as a closer 
approximate snapshot of what is going on in, in, in as if they were doing it naturally. So exactly, yeah. We do also um, in this case we film them for about forty minutes, uh, right. Their interaction, and then we use computers to help us analyze that data. Okay. And uh, once again, so Shit. that's why. That's so oh why wow, you wrote the code for that too. Uh, well, not yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we call we call it um, supervised machine learning, right? So mm. we we teach um, the computer to tell us when, how often mm. they interact, or a certain type of behavior. Maybe there's aggression. Maybe there's other mm. kinds of um, mm. cleaning behavior, or. Um, but that's on one side is the behavioral yeah, yeah. part, that and then the other part is where we look at um, what happens in their in their brains, basically. Right. And what we saw is that um, just interaction versus non-interaction is that the cleaner ras really um, endorphins kind of goes on fire, basically. Endorphins. Um, no, not as so. There's a lot of um, um, uh, hormones involved, um, and it just it there's a lot of signals in the brain that it just activates um, especially the hindbrain so different regions of the brain and uh, have different um, kind of yeah and decision making is usually kind of made in in parts of the hindbrain so if you could strap and on an EEG onto onto the heads of these things oh, I'd you, love you to. it would yeah it would I did, it's just impossible it would go I up mean, like a christmas tree wouldn't yeah. it <laughs> And okay. then, you know, you, how do you put a fish in an MRI? No, no, I know. Ah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it swims, you know, you can't like, the, you know, that's yeah. the thing about it. But yeah, um, yeah so we, but then we use these indicators. So certain genes that are expressed mm. uh, means that um, um, kind of neuronal activity is being activated. And uh, so we see that happening mostly in the, Fascinating. in that cleaner ras in a certain area of their brain. Um, and then uh, when they interact with the, uh, so the client itself actually has a bit of a difference uh, to kind of the control by being by itself. Okay. Um, uh, has a few different kind of hormones in there, yeah. but it doesn't do that much, hasn't much, doesn't have much of a change, let's say it like that. Okay, okay. And then comes that whole aspect of, of course, what happens in with future climate change, right? So then, then we also have these um, both both organisms exposed to elevated temperature, yep. elevated CO two, and the combined effects of them. Right. And then we also went and had a look at what they do when they interact, being yep. in those environments. Right. Right. And uh, while we haven't really looked into the molecular data yet, uh, we do know that um, mostly that interaction is quite affected by pH changes, by CO two changes. Negatively. Um, I mean, it could be a positive catalyst. That is always then the question that comes afterwards, right? So yeah. this is a, an aquarium setup where we test a kind of a mechanistic approach. What what different mechanisms do they use mm. to deal with an environmental change that then ends up leading to a change in their behavior? Mm. Um, so if that in the natural environment is then a positive or a negative thing, requires more studies, to be honest. But mm. we would probably say that if they interact less, that it's not a very good um, indication. Because we already <laughs> have enough information to the 40% loss. So, uh, and, and yeah, so if they don't interact as much or if the cleaner cleans less, um, then that would be probably um, um, a negative effect, right? Well, there also might be like, uh, which is completely separate, like m there might be more parasites in a, pH, in a more acidified water, well, which might make these guys, you know, it's a, like, yeah. Right. So I, I know they actually study this with, um, um, so I'm a bit involved with some parasite um, biologists. Yeah. Um, they're looking into temperature actually more than into pH because temperature okay. is, is happening right now in the natural environment. Right. Um, very much more drastic with heat waves especially. Right? Oh yes. Um, so the CO2 is steadily rising, um, but we don't necessarily have massive like pH waves that then propel us several um, hundreds of um, um, microatmospheres of uh, CO2 upwards or downwards, yeah. um, unless it's already in the natural system. But we do have unnaturally um, hot um, waves of like these temperature heat waves coming, marine heat waves as well as, as land he uh, heat waves, right? right. They are heat waves. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so there are people start looking into if there's an increase uh, of parasites in, in this case. Um, 
not quite sure what the answer was to it anymore. But no, that's it, fine. They were calling out for that it might be an important um, factor to consider as well. Mm. Maybe not so much with the cleaner rasp in general, but yeah. in general, the effect, the health of other organisms, yes. right? So it's all a balance in, in terms yeah. of uh, yeah. certain things might increase and then... Um, that might be detrimental, but then something else might be negative and something else might be negative and then it adds up all together, right? So sure. then, um, uh, there might, but yeah, some, some things might increase in abundance, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. with the, actually they will increase. Certain organisms will increase with a change in, in the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Where to next for your lab? I mean, it, it, it looks like I, I went onto your website and it looks like you've got a Happy, healthy, bouncing lab going on oh, there. Oh, yes, they're great. <laughs> yeah, I have a, I have people from all over the place. Yeah. Um, and it's lovely. We we have lots of miscommunications because of everybody actually speaks a different language in oh, theory, right? Oh, yeah. Um, but it makes it so much in, more interesting, right? Because oh. we come, and this is what I I find so important to emphasize over and over again that, um, with with us humans seeming to become more kind of this is mine and and that's the border or that's the you know it's all oh, it becomes that, dangerous then. and um science is global yeah and we all have different ways of thinking about a certain topic or have learned different schools of thought mm -hmm. and that makes it so um interesting to have this diverse lab from people um that come from all different places and have grown up in other places because everyone has a different perspective mm. and that's what i think makes a good more holistic um um, understanding of something if you be, are able to introduce all these other um, views or ways of going about things right yeah um, and communicating that information um, that's the challenge then yeah <laughs> yeah I don't know there, there's, there's a trend towards this more nationalistic sort of I mean like what with the virus and whatnot you know that's caused everybody to sort of you know the turtles heads have all gone in yep. sucked straight in and yes. it's like oh no don't want to talk to you I suppose that's also massively affected communication, but at the same time, uh, we've never been more communicated in the form of like a digital, like what's going to go, like this, this very thing is going to be communicated out to potentially <gasps> millions and millions and millions of people, but you know, <laughs> obviously not that many. <laughs> you don't have to laugh so loud. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was actually more laughing about thinking about that, that this millions of people would uh, watch us chat for well, three that's, hours. That's, <laughs> that's, yeah, well, you know, that's, don't, 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 yeah, it, it actually, yeah, yeah, maybe not now. <laughs> Over time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, one of the things that David Attenborough um, dedicated to the second half of his witness statement so the first half was essentially going into where the problems are, um, what's happening, and you know by the the middle part of the of the film, you know you're reaching for your your pistol. You're yeah. just re you're you're ready. You're like let's just do it, let's just get it over and let's pull the band aid basically. Just kidding. And then he's like, well, it's not that bad, you know, we, we can, I mean, no, no, it's not the words that he said. <laughs> he said, it's, it, you, yeah, there's still, you know, we can still do stuff to improve the situation. And what the, what he sort of laid out, I thought was actually quite good. And uh, uh, these sort of five step plan kind of thing, you know. I suppose one of them, and just to summarize it, one, one of them would be to, the first one would be to get off uh, carbon, uh, hy hydrogen, car hydrocarbons, uh, uh, fuels. One, doesn't, doesn't make sense. doesn't make sense that, that we're poisoning ourselves, that we're, you know, the, the, all of the effects that, that's, that's happening. That's really an important one. The second one is, is, is the oceans. Um, um, because oceans play such an important role at regulating the CO2 and he goes about saying that we should we should do something similar to what Pal Palau did did Palau is a is in micro 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 Micronesia micro Asia micro Asia Micronesia that's the one that's the one Micronesia yeah in that area and, and I saw that I was like it was a really nice place I wouldn't mm -hmm. mind going but what they did was they noticed that their fish stock, their environment was sort of like 
going on the down. Mm -hmm. So they basically made large swaths of this of this land to be um, uh, like the equivalent of national parks. Mm -hmm. Marine reserves. Marine reserve. Yes. <laughs> You're correcting my terminology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a marine reserve. Yeah. And as a result, what had happened was that the fish life bounced back mm -hmm. with such ferocity that that the normal fishing places were basically restocked. So, so you know, there was, there was, you know, it was so much uh, thriving that uh, people could start eating again as a result. So, you know, it would be good. And he was suggesting that, like the UN, so sort of go as far as to sort of declare all the international waters as as a marine reserve, essentially. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. Like, uh, and, and, and then it would also be up for the national, uh, the countries to actually declare certain areas to, to become marine reserves. And you let these areas thrive. We wouldn't have the, we wouldn't be in the position where we don't have enough, like, you know, well, like I, I don't eat fish, but I mean, there would be enough to, 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 to fish stocked for, for people to sort of like, dip into. That was the second thing. We can carry on going. It looks like you want to have make a point. But I, I might, I'm not sure if I want to wait for the last three. No, that's what I point. That's what, that's, what, that's what my point is. Yeah, no, let, let, you, you shoot on your point there. Okay, so, so his first one, I, I really need to see this movie and I wish I kind of did my homework before, but... Uh, you no, know, no, I, I should have mentioned so, it in the email though. Yeah. I, I surprised you. A surprise exactly. attacked you. <laughs> Jesus. So, so the first uh, sorry, what did you say? There was the, the first, first one was reducing oh, the. Uh, okay. Uh, no, the first one was the. Uh, yeah, electric. Yeah, rem yeah. Re reduce um, the amount of CO two. Basically, stop burning fossil fuels. Mm. Um, it's key, to be mm. honest, in in many things. Mm. Uh, climate change is happening because of mainly because of the CO two we're putting out. We're taking carbon from that is stored, and we're burning it, and we're putting it out there, which is then having these. I understand unrelatable effects because there's processes happening and then in the end there's higher temperatures and more CO2 going into the oceans and things like yeah. that. But it is it really is essential to, to cut that. That's the first and foremost, right? But but in a sense you you're burning you're burning uh, sunlight. Million year old sunlight. Well, <laughs> it's you know, plants have converted it into <laughs> I, okay. Yeah, I know. I know. Let's let's yeah, dramatize it a bit. The, no. the thing about it is, there's a reason it's stored, right? Yes, exactly. And, and and you bring it all out. If you bring a little bit out of it, sure. But yeah. we are just massively doing yeah. this, right? Yeah. So the problem is this: the the rep, like the speed of things yeah. and the speed of how much we are changing it. Yeah. Um. And so the the key there is to stop the source, right? So there's mm. a lot of Actually, you mentioned band-aids. I fi find there's a lot of band-aids of trying to deal with things where you you're patching up things that aren't are that are kind of half dead or something. You're trying to fix things like um, you know build artificial things or um, um, you know help certain animals cross. And I you know there's a whole lot of uh, things that might have local effects. But generally, um, you have to start with the source of evil, let's say it like that, if you want to look You're at it right. that way. You're right, yeah. If you don't take that away, it's just you're just putting a Band-Aid on and then it's just kind of going to get maybe a little better, but it's never going to go away, right? Yeah. So it's the same with, with a disease. You end up, you, if you take aspirin, you might feel better, but you're not... Um, depending right. on what it is, but you're mostly, most likely not treating the disease, right? So you yeah. have to end up going and, um, and get, have a stop um, producing that, that much CO2 or not producing yeah. it, but putting it out there, right? Mm. Um, and yeah, your skin is falling off. Walk away from that radioactive source, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> and the thing about it is, is that we are actually capable of doing it as a mm -hmm. human race. We have the technology, we have mm -hmm. um, the knowledge, um, it's it really it's an economical willpower at this point, where you then are kind of disappointed as a scientist. Of course, I'm not I'm not an economist. I'm not <laughs> um, right, but where you're like, well, what? Please, somebody explain to me why we're why we're so lagging behind in this, and why there's so many people with 
some power that feel like there's no necessity in doing and caring yeah. about others, right? So it's yeah, it's hard to understand from my from my perspective yeah. why well, why there isn't more of a move um, towards more more change. It's interesting you 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 framed it in that way. One of the reasons for me starting this was because and there's a number of reasons. One of them is I noticed the reaction that people had towards the pandemic. One, there is the willpower when people focus on something short term, like, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, we can flatten the curve, flatten the curve. And people can, they tend to flatten the curve. But, you know, then like, ah. my point is, you can mobilize people in such a way. But at the same time, looking at those individuals that we consider as, 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 the informers, how can I say, the, the, the people we look up, authorities and whatnot, they can fuck up. Oh, oh yeah. and they I fucked mean, up quite nicely yeah. during this one. Yeah. So, you know, I, I also don't want... <laughs> what, would, what would make me livid is if people turned... used the same way, have been sort of like, you know, uh, uh, if people have learned to not respect or not to listen to the scientific authority because of what happened with the pandemic and say, oh, well, you know, like, okay, uh, they were wrong. Maybe the WHO, etc., were wrong about the masks. Da, 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 da. So why do we need to listen to science at all? I think that would be an extremely dangerous thing to do. Oh, and oh, it, it's, it's unfortunately, I, I don't think that science necessarily handled the pandemic badly. <laughs> It's mostly that information that's being received by, by very politicians that makes the cho- make the choices. In the so country, right? yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I think most people, probably even here in Hong Kong, you would accept quite easily any restriction if it's explained from a scientific point of view. From a, yeah, and and it was and, it was presented to us from a very scientific pr- and, point of view. And if. Uh, some of those restrictions are not really based on a scientific point of view. People are quite like, why am I doing this, right? What, what's what's the reason Good for point. this? And so I do think that, but it, it is maybe here and some other places, and you're right that there's a lot of people that are just going to- totally against what science is saying. Um, but I think it's, again, the same problem about relating. Um, so most people who don't have someone who got sick and had COVID or um, they're like is this actually happening? Who has this? Mm. Somebody is telling me this. Same like climate change these scientists are telling me this that it's getting warmer because you know but I don't actually see it. Um, I don't have a relative who's been sick. I don't have anyone who had died. So as a large amount of people on this planet that are in that situation and um, then it becomes again this whole belief thing. Either Mm. you believe the scientist or you don't which is which you know for me is is obviously bizarre because science yeah. is a, it ends up being a fact mm. and of course with the pandemic i would have thought that you realize how important science is mm. while on one hand it takes science some time to understand things right i mean our research usually we're, we're talking about years when we start an experiment right so here everybody was mobilized to oh, yeah. to try and work on this and find out things in speed record time yeah. and insane advances have been made over the last what are we at we're, we're october right now it's less, say, less than months. a year we just we just have less than a year is enough right <laughs> so it's it's been really um uh, a push forward and scientists have come together and there's been all things like uh, you know as you're um, kind of into computational sciences is that um, a lot of um, computer sciences and we're also digging into the data really fast and yeah. and, um, and we ha- have a lot of knowledge about this um, well on one hand about the virus and secondly about the disease because in, in 10 months Yep. any other disease we know nothing about over like 10 years right so well, let alone a vaccine right so it takes many years. exactly <laughs> so that's why generally I think I um, it's hard to understand why the faith in science would be lost at this case because really the, the, all we know over the, the last months 
um, has been because of a massive effort of science. And we know a lot more than we did 10, yeah. 10 months ago. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so people can't expect science to happen to be like, why don't you know anything about this, right? Mm, <laughs> mm. It does take a little bit of time to, to um, study things. Yeah. Um, Okay, but coming back to your original question, we were talking about the uh, the first point, which was uh, exactly. re uh, reducing of CO two. the unrelatedness of things. So people have issues with relating to things. So oh. for you to turn on an aircon or to to use energy, you don't see that or don't necessarily think that that might is producing uh, CO two out in the atmosphere and that's causing yeah. all these downstream effects, right? So on a personal level, that's that's where where yeah, certain things that you can be doing. Whereas this even on a much bigger level is, is factories and, and uh, no bigger companies, right? That, yeah. um, it's unrelated. You go to work, you don't know what anyone else is doing and, and uh, people who are calling the shots are uh, maybe not necessarily interested in saving the planet, but more in, in their pockets. So. And uh, talking about pockets or directness or rather lack of directness, I mean, di uh, lack of directness, what Attenborough did mention was many retirement funds and in investors are investing money in hydrocarbon you know oil companies etc so then it that's a really good that's a very direct way of of having an effect on the environment around you pull your money from these oil companies pull your money from all these in, uh, investment companies that specialize in oil and 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 and, and doing this because th this this talks to the bottom this talks to the the, the pocket. It's, it's 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 a very direct way. Uh, vote with your money. Yes. So you you can. I mean, I think you can have a large scale of direct effects. Even though one yeah. might think I don't have. I'm just one individual in this planet. With how many are we by now? Eight billion. Don't or nine don't billion? no no. But, go on go but, on. You know you like. Have, but you have you can have real direct effects in terms of how you. Um, influence yeah. what companies do, right? Yeah. Um, and make decisions, make more conscious decisions mm, so that right. other processes are more sustainable. Mm. So you can have your own things, right? For example, number one, reduce plastic, right? That's, the, that's literally the first relatable thing honestly actually i was hoping that now because we're all kind of stuck in it uh, not stuck that sounds negative but we're all but here we in are. hong kong where we are <laughs> um, uh, and we're everyone's stuck. going out to sai kung and they're going out to the islands and we're all we're like doing staycations what, exactly but we're like one next to the each other other hiking on those hike, hiking paths all of a sudden and i hope that some of the people who might not ever visit these areas see that there's garbage floating around everywhere mm. Mm. And in that case, you are in these beautiful settings and you realize, oh, crap, that might be, you know, the plastic that I bought from <laughs> or the plastic bags that I get every day because I don't bring my reusable bag. There's a million little things that you can do. So plastic is a very relatable thing. You see plastic because it does not disappear. Mm. Um, the other part is the whole energy consumption thing, which is, like we said, a little bit more unrelatable, unre where you then choose companies or choose to buy things from companies that are much more conscious about it, right? Mm. Uh, or to invest your money in certain things that, uh, or definitely not invest them in, yeah. <laughs> in yeah. oil companies <laughs> uh, or uh, other companies where I would be guessing, isn't that kind of a going going toward the past I feel anyways but yeah. to invest it into something um, like innovative and more sustainable mm. and those are the little things that we can do that actually make a pretty large effect and imagine yeah. that many of us are doing this we, we can change um, mm. there is the power there um, like you said we can vote with <laughs> with our money yes um, and it's not voting for, for political parties <laughs> in, uh, but it's voting towards a company that either does one thing or the other right right, right. Um, and that's really important yeah. in terms of reducing the CO2 and just making a, a general change in how we mm. view our planet, right? So mm. you can cannot keep exploiting, just exploit, exploit, exploit. And then there's companies that exploit the environment, they exploit their people. How are we still buying from these companies, right? So these are, these are things that are something you have an influence mm. on. To a certain extent, yeah. you know, and, and the um, second one was uh, well, well, turning your 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 marine creating marine oh, yes. reserves. Oh, yes. That was the second one, okay. right? Okay, so <laughs> marine reserve. You would then mention also 
uh, these pockets of marine reserves mm. um, over uh, in many places. So there's an effect that we call a spillover effect. Oh, is that what it is? That what yeah, the, is exactly. that, okay, so that's, that's a what, that's term. kind of what I wanted and, to and jump like, in. <laughs> 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 um, marine reserves, um, they're kind of like no fishing zones or no take zones, um, have a lot of diversity there and it has the ability to produce more, right? And that's when it then spills over. So right. A lot of the uh, marine organisms, especially, they have what we call external fertilization. So males and females basically just put out their um, sperm, sperm and, and eggs, eggs out into the environment yeah. and they get fertilized. And then these poor How little, poor little Good buggers are God. all on their own <laughs> <laughs> in the big oceans. So, <laughs> and but by doing this is that they actually get transported or actively kind of swim to a certain extent, but get transported far away. So sometimes, and that's how these populations are connected with each other. And if you have then a really healthy um, reef or kelp forest or whatever ecosystem you can think it's of. It's just... It's pumping out all these like fertilized eggs. <laughs> you can look at it that way. But then to more poor areas, poor, poor in terms of their ecosystem health, um, you end up um, contributing to them and you help replenish them a little bit. So there is yeah. a, this spillover effect that is there. Um, you do need to have a good network of, of um, uh, marine area, uh, protected areas then though. So you can't just have one marine protected area in the middle and then think it's going to just take right, care of all right, the right, others. Right. There is a whole um, set to kind of have networks that um, at a certain distance and certain sizes of marine reserves that are optimal to then have the whole ecosystem. Spillover effect. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, this would be spectacular. Do we have anything like this in Hong Kong? Or do we have the government which is more, you know, pandering to she's a dictator Xi Jinping and, and, uh, and uh, what's going on there? We, we, I ha mean, we have marine protected areas. Oh, we do, do we? Fascinating. Phenomenal. <laughs> but... Significant? <laughs> there's a but to it. Uh, they're tiny, number one, which uh -huh. often, eh, let's say that small marine reserves don't necessarily do much. And um, secondly, some of them are not very enforced, right? Oh, right, okay. So you so make the rules, you need to have the police to... Oh, yes, yes. To, to, marine to protect. So the Great Barrier Reef, the reason why, um, actually today, BBC just published, um, based on scientific knowledge from Australia, is uh, a coral reef scientist, 50% uh, of the Great Barrier Reef has died since 1995. It's super depressing. It is so sad to see because the Great Barrier Reef is such a spectacular. Um, uh, have you had the um, opportunity to no. go to Australia? No, the I've, been, I've been there. I mean, I've been to Australia a few times, but I've never actually gone to the Great Barrier Reef. It's, it's marvelous, yeah. right? So th there are some, some places around the world where you just, it's absolutely beautiful. Oh. The marine, um, uh, the Great Barrier Reef is highly protected by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. And they do a really good job at patrolling it. So right. no take zones are real no take zones here, there, for sure. No take zone means no fishing. Exactly. Okay. Um, and so they have different like levels of what you can fish in certain places. Yeah. And it's really highly protected. So in terms of overfishing and these kinds of um, really important direct impacts um, are really controlled there. But the reef is still dying because of things because like heat waves yeah. and which mm. is climate change, which you can't just control there. You have to control it globally. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so marine parks will definitely help. Um, especially with the whole overfishing part because we have all these these stressors on the marine environment yeah. right so so we have we take out all the all the organisms that we like uh, for example we like to eat fish and then um, we accidentally catch all the kind of bigger mammals and turtles in our net and uh, dolphins in, uh, and uh, things like that exactly hmm. and um, so those are kind of we overtake out what part of the ecosystem which is important and then we add pollution to the mix. So also the litter cr critters are struggling because it's, there's pollutants in the water that they can't deal with mm. um, or have a hard time dealing with. And um, yeah, so I mean, doomsday scenario, you end up with just a bunch of algae. <laughs> yeah. Um, but 
This is like, it's you know, devolution, I'm, right? You're going I'm, back. Without needing to be all, all that dramatic, like you said, just like um, <laughs> he went, Attenborough went just like, why don't we just shoot each other? No, 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 I said that. He <laughs> oh, didn't okay, say that. Oh, okay, that, that is so atypical of him. Oh, yeah. That's more typical of me. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I don't want to be that doomsday um, because there is some resilience in the ecosystem. Um, and... Even if the ecosystem shifts, maybe some of it might not be necessarily just like ho horribly bad, right? Right. But I do want to emphasize that we have so many different factors, so many different pressures mm. that are created by us, right? And yep. some really directly, you take out too many fish, there aren't that many. You put pollution in there, well, it's going to make stuff die, right? It's pretty obvious. And then you add to the mix the climate change where you where we are increasing in temperature, yep. decreasing in, in the pH. Yeah. So... It's too much. Yeah. That's the problem, right? Um, so marine parks would help to a certain extent. It doesn't help with climate change mostly, right? Yeah. So it helps with the other f effects that we're having, yeah. the more direct ones on, on climate yeah. change, uh, so on, uh, on the marine environment. So, so I suppose the first, the first point, which would be the reducing of CO2, would, would have an effect on, for example, this, even though these uh, marine reserves are being preserved, you know, you're still working on this level, and it requires everybody. This is the equivalent of a pandemic. You're right, everybody, everybody, let's move forward. You know, stop investing in these companies, starve them. Um, and then he goes on to the third point. Now, the third point is, 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 is quite interesting to me. It's like, um, bio, the, the biomass of this earth, this is a, dis if, I don't know this if, if this is real or not. I, I haven't verified this information, but it's Attenborough. I should imagine that you know <laughs> he it, 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 sources, he's probably so got a yeah. you know he's probably relying on some very good information yes. that up to what was, I think believe was sixty or seventy percent of the biomass on this earth is farmed animals, like like uh, animals for our consumption, something along that on, along that thing. This we're we are about thirty percent. And some mere four percent. That's everything from mice to elephant. That's everything else, of the of the mammals and animals. That's everything else. That that's like like we we now own this earth. We have essentially destroyed it, to that degree. So he was saying, one very direct way of doing this is by becoming vegetarian. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So you become vegetarian. Again, like the like you, you're starving the the oil companies. Now you're not putting money into 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 these great big farm animals that that require and 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 he he brought the analogy of like a predator requires a large large amount of land to survive. And he was just saying that this earth just cannot sustain so many predators. Yeah. So and we can get the nutrition that we need by being vegetarian. Which brought him to the next point, which was, yeah, maybe maybe you want to talk. Do you have anything to say I'm, on that I'm one? I'm surprised about the biomass one, to be honest, because plants are would also count. As oh, biomass oh, okay, mam so mammals, mammals. Ma ma oh, okay. The the maybe biomass is the wrong word. Mammals, a animals, animals, animals. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that might be. I, um, I don't know. But yeah, I animals, mean, he's, yeah. he's 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 totally. Um, not, well, I'm not saying that Edinburgh would ever be wrong, but um, we do know that every time you eat something, you kind of lose ninety percent of of that energy, basically. So if a cow eats a plant, ten percent of that will go into its muscles and fat and things like that, and then we eat the cow. So basically, of the plant, we get. A small percentage, right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> that's that's pretty uh, standard, not standard, but like well known knowledge. Well understood. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, if you have more um, levels in there that this eats that, this eats that, this eats that, then you end up um, um, having very little energy from that first <laughs> um, first yes. consumption. Um, and it is definitely true. So um, meat consumption does contribute to a large um, proportion plus the fact that cows um love to fart <laughs> did he say that too Please no he didn't he say that, that he didn't know. <laughs> oh, oh that would be amazing <laughs> yes. um 
yeah, so I, I think meat consumption is definitely something uh, t- uh, to reduce. Um, and yeah. generally, I find when you're trying to convince people to see your side of things and they let's say believe in something else to tell them that they have to become vegetarians might be hard yeah um but just starting with the fact that you not every meal has meat in it yeah i think that's what he was more along he was like increase our you know the the green intake you know reduce the meat like it's healthier for you anyways to be honest but um, sure sure yeah Sure. So when you think about it, should I eat something that has uh, beef in it, right? Especially in a place where you might not have any of that yeah. here. Uh, so it's also transported from abroad. Um, yeah. How often do I actually that, consume this? That's a good point. This? Yeah. So it's two factors there. The whole logistic chain too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and he 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 led into the the next point, which was like as as. Uh, herbivores you can make really really efficient use of space to grow your food and the analogy he brought uh, well what the example he brought up was holland apparently holland is the number two food export in the world this is this is little old holland uh, apparently it was just tulips no and no cheese. god no no <laughs> i think they learned their lesson from that you know like uh <laughs> that bubble right um um no but but Apparently, they've done so much research and, and uh, investment into into economical uh, growth of, of uh, uh, pl- plants. They're, they're growing vertically. Everything's hydroponics. Um, they've got these lovely, tom- you know, it's 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic way. I mean, you you could potentially, with a few countries, you could potentially feed the world. And you know, one of the signs of this for me is is that technology really is a Let's embrace it. Yeah. There's so many advances being made, and the same with the fossil fuels industry. Why are we still there if we have technology to, to harvest other kinds of um, um, sources of energy, right? Yeah. We have that technology nowadays, and some people might disagree, but whatever, there's not enough to store it, it's other problems with it, but really, we, we have made huge advances. Um, mm. And just, um, that's why it's used like technology and... and make this a mm. cleaner earth yeah. and a more healthier planet yeah and, and and the final point that he brought up was by going vegetarian or reducing meat consumption you are and you increase the the, the ability to do farming on a much more smaller land scale what happens next is you do what costa rica did which was you know, Costa Rica recognized that their ecosystems was like, you know, the deforestation was, was quite, so they, so they, they incentivized. And I, you know, we can disagree on, or agree on, on incentivization. It has the problem of the, the Cobra effect. Do you know, are familiar with the Cobra? So the, Brit, the Brits in, in India, they, they wanted to get rid of king cobras. So they paid people to get rid of the king cobras. So instead what they did was they bred King cobras, so it had the reverse effect. Oh, you see okay. what I mean? So, so, so the cobra effect, right? Yeah. Um, uh, well, anyway, they they subsidized farmers to say, use your land and and grow forest and the natural occurring species. And as a result, you know, Costa Rica has has, has seen a massive bounce back in in their in their in their forests uh, environment. So, um, so by reducing the amount of land that we need we can actually reforest which sucks more co2 out of the air mm-hmm. sequesters it so to say and he was saying like yeah don't 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 all deforestation needs to stop like he was also showing like gut wrenching photographs of of the palm oil industry how they've deforested massive sweats but then the, like the marketing is like oh yeah we take a photograph of you got your palm oil on one side and you got your forest lovely forest on the other side apparently that's all bullshit yeah, it's just like a mile stretch in between of, of the, the natural forest. The rest is, the rest is just palm oil. It becomes this, this complicated topic where um, very often in the countries where these things are produced um, yeah. is, you know, there's just farmers trying to feed their families. Yeah. That have not enough or don't get the ed- education to understand what that means. Mm. And then they convert their land into monocultures. Because yeah. that's the only way how to industrialize things at a massive scale. Right? Mm. So I'll just have lots and lots and lots and lots of them. 
comes with massive problems for, you know, in terms of climate change, like you just said, because we've taken away all the trees. That, uh, but it also comes at a kind of a cost to other diversity, right? So mm. you end up just having uh, one pest species. So you get rid of all the insects, you get rid of all the other things because they yeah. used to be, uh, you know, they, they live on that flower or this one lives in, in this kind of soil. And then you end up changing that whole ecosystem yeah. to just have this monoculture of one type of tree. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it has massive effects, but the problem is, is you can't point the finger at the at the farmer in um, Indonesia or whatever. Where point they, the fingers where at ourselves. Oh yes, it's ourselves, but it's mainly at larger companies that yeah. decide to. Um, well, we're the one who are keeping them afloat. Yeah. Yeah. It's very depressing, I and mean, it's just a Wednesday. Why were you? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, no. I'm just I mean joking. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I think. Um, because you end up kind of also you can get overwhelmed with it and that's why uh, I think there's there's just so little action that had happened that we had these really young people go out in the streets and say we need climate action we need you to not destroy our generation right um, it really is time it really is time for uh -huh. for um, heads of com countries and companies um, to make a change um, in in a better in a in a in a direction that has a future. So remember how I, I study <laughs> fish transgenerationally, right? Yeah. Um, we can't just be thinking of uh, about us right now, right? So the next generation will come, and the generation after that, and um, it's really horrible to destroy everything for for those um, in just our one lifetime. It's mm. um, yeah. It's yeah. Pretty detrimental what we've done over the last fifty years. So yeah, but um, I, I don't know the the reaction that we've had. We, we can see it. It's very clear. You know, human beings can adapt to these rather extreme, maybe sudden events. Um, yeah, maybe climate change might be a little bit more slower. But why don't we take the lessons that we've done well, so that we've learned from the the climate change, uh, the the pandemic, and try to plan it apply it to so this. So let me ask you something. So if the, a pandemic where, <laughs> where um, in, in the case of where we live in, in a, a place like Hong Kong, um, we probably have, some don't, but a lot of the people might have kind of the luxury of staying at home um, in this case. Um, so comparing it with, with in the future lack of food for example let's yeah. say that in 50 years from now we really do have uh, total um, um, disruption difference, or right. no just the um, well, disparity is fair exactly of um, access to food uh -huh. and then I don't think we can we will be dealing with it well <laughs> at all right because it becomes a real survival issue and, uh -huh. and then what do animals that aren't able to survive do? I mean, they fight for it, right? So yep. um, the pandemic wasn't aggressive in that way because it just kind of made us actually more individualistic retreat. I and see. In, in the places where we had the luxury, especially just to stay home, that's why they were always joking, like, you know, there were wars before and now we just have to stay on oh, our couch. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> we let, so, this is our generation's war. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, oh, like, fucking grow up, be, Jesus you Christ. You can watch Netflix on your couch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think it's a more drastic, uh, uh, actually, I mean, don't get me, I don't want to say the pandemic's not drastic, don't get me wrong. But I do think that is a, a an no, even what, larger challenge yeah. for survival. So what's it, what's in store for us? Yeah, makes makes what we've been through with the pandemic look like child play, basically. Mm, probably, yeah. It's uh, slower. It's not as abrupt yeah. as the pandemic happened, when everyone yeah. just like, oh my god! Within one or two months, it was all over the world, and yeah. everyone had to deal with it all of a sudden. Yeah. It's going to be a little bit more creeping in, right? But yeah. it's going to happen. Um, but it's even worse because then we'll be like the the frog in the boiling in, in the boil the water that's boiling going to boil you know do you know the analogy i'm talking about mm -mm. oh come on oh uh, you can either yeah, yeah, you take a pot you know you take a pot of water yeah. you put a frog in it the water's cold okay and then you gently bring the temperature mm -hmm. up of that water and you can cook that you can kill the frog you, the frog won't jump out you'll be like yeah i'm sitting here i'm cool i'm cool i'm cool and then just die and but if you but if you, like you if you put them into like hot water they'll jump out so 
what's okay. the frog in the bo- I th- well, I have never tried that. I don't know if it's if the, if it's actually true uh, but, or not. But it might just be a yeah a, <laughs> yeah, a yeah. good example of if that something is creeping up slowly, yeah. um, and you don't change anything about it, then yeah, yeah. yeah you're doomed. But yeah. yeah, if you're hit with something hard, then yeah. yeah. How do people can contact you? Yeah. Go to your website, your Celia. Yes. So um, you can go to com, my website. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Celia Shunter. I don't know, Shunter. or whatever language you want to pronounce it in, but that's probably the most English way to pronounce it. And um, dot com is my website. Uh-huh. And um, there you'll find my email address for sure. Yeah. Um, and can just shoot me an email or write a message over that webpage. It's probably the easiest way. Great. I am also on Twitter. Which I don't remember my handle. Probably my name, Celia Shunter. Okay, so um, I can find you on Twitter. Exactly. All right. Yes. And then what? What can we look look forward to? Um, latest research to look up, look forward to. What you working on? On my Twitter. No. Well, you will announce all that stuff. Ah, uh, yes. Twitter? So oh, okay, Twitter is, uh, is, right. is very work related. So I, okay. I retweet science and good. I tweet about my science and good. my student science and um, once in a while a funny meme about science, but it's all <laughs> science related for sure. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for coming in. It's been lovely. I, I Good. would love to chat just a few hours more about science at uh, oh, any time. So it's thanks nice, for yeah. having me. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to... Okay, we'll, let's kill it.